Order, order. Carol Monaghan to move the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosendale. Uh, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I thank the Backbench Business Committee for giving members the opportunity to raise their points in this afternoon's debate. It's estimated that around a quarter of a million people in the UK suffer from myalgic encephalomyelitis, or ME, which costs the UK around £3.3 billion per annum. While the exact cause of the disease is unknown, numerous patients report that their ME has developed following a viral infection. ME is characterised by flu-like symptoms, which can vary in severity from headaches and muscle aches to debilitating pain, extreme sensitivity to light and sound, and memory and concentration problems. For some, even touch is intolerable and tube feeding is required. Despite the number of people affected and the devastating effect this disease has on sufferers and indeed their families, it is very much a hidden illness, characterised by some as yuppie flu and misunderstood by doctors, the public and politicians alike. Darrow. I thank the Honourable Lady for giving away. She's quite right that doctors do not research this enough. They don't have adequate training to actually suss it out, to use it for want of a better term. But more importantly, under 1% of children is badly affected by this, and very often employers as well don't understand that illness. Would she not agree with me about yeah. that? I, I would agree entirely with my honourable friend. And one of the, the most tragic situations is children who are not able to attend school and for whom social services become involved when they consider there is an issue in terms of their care. I will. We're uh, giving way. Uh, Would she also agree that it, it, it is particularly difficult for those perhaps uh, attending assessments for benefits who may be on a day when the symptoms are not as bad and there is not that acceptance that this is a, uh, an, an illness that can be very bad but then some of that can obviously be not quite as bad on other days mm -hmm. and, and the benefit system needs to look at the longer term picture rather than just the, the, the very short term. Uh, one, of, one of the things that has been reported and I will come on to, to the, the um, interactions with DWP but one of the things that patients with ME report is that energy levels vary and sometimes going to an appointment like that can wipe out a person for many weeks afterwards. So yes, if they were to try and report to the same uh, appointment the following day, a very different person would be seen. Um, I'm most, to be very generous, I'm most grateful and I'm delighted that she's secured this debate. Uh, the Honourable Lady has referred to the seriousness and the scale of, uh, of ME and then how many people are, are affected. Would she agree with me that for it to be really taken seriously and, and proportionately to the, to the scale of, of the impact that it has, that needs to be reflected in every area, including the amount of medical research that is devoted uh, to ME. It's certainly a point that constituents of mine are very concerned that should be raised in this debate. At the moment, ME receives practically no funding in terms of the biomedical research, and I'll come on to that aspect in particular a little later in this, my speech. Um, but because of the, the misunderstanding of this condition, the treatments that are currently available are often more damaging to the person than no treatment at all. Merrin Crofts was just 15 when she experienced hives and swelling in her jo joints after a family holiday in Mallorca. Tests revealed that she had contracted glandular fever. Despite dozens of medical appointments, Merrin's condition deteriorated as she su suffered breathing problems, exhaustion and excruciating hypersensitivity to touch, light and sound. She was eventually diagnosed with ME. This once bright young woman was forced to wear an eye mask suffered from severe migraines, brain fog, slurred speech and persistent infections. Stomach problems and difficulty swallowing meant that her weight plummeted to just five and a half stone. Merrin was eventually fitted with an intravenous nutrition line, but was given a terminal diagnosis in 2016. Merrin wrote in her blog, 
Having severe ME is like being trapped in your own body every single day. There's no rest. You're bedbound all day, every day. It snatches the most simple things away from you, like being able to wash yourself even in bed, being cared for in every way possible, in terrible pain from everything, not being able to talk on the phone or have visitors and feeling worse about saying no every time someone asks again. Months and months in hospital, severe infections, breathing problems, low immunity, problems anywhere and everywhere in the body, paralysis, severe hypersensitivity, the list is endless. And if I was physically able to type, I would carry on. Spread awareness and remember all of us and all those who have lost their lives. Merrin died on May the 23rd last year just days after her 21st birthday. So why is the treatment for people with ME so poor? The lack of understanding shown by some healthcare professionals of a person suffering is one of the greatest frustrations to the ME community. But much of this has stemmed from the publication of the controversial PACE trial. The treatments investigated in the PACE trial were based on the hypothesis that ME patients harbour unhelpful convictions about having a disease, and that the continuation of their symptoms is a result of deconditioning. The PACE trial compared different treatments, including cognitive behaviour therapy, CBT, and graded exercise therapy, GET. The results were published in The Lancet in 2011 and seemed to show that GET and CBT could bring about some improvements in a person with ME. Whilst this may seem positive, dig a little deeper and we discovered that the parameters for recovery were changed midway through the trial and the results depended on self-reporting. Patients have told me they were pressurised to describe improvements they really did not feel. One participant in the original trial said, After repeatedly been asked how severe my symptoms were, I started to feel like I had to put a positive spin on my answers. I could not be honest about just how bad it was, as that would tell the doctors I wasn't trying and I wasn't being positive enough. Giving way. She's uh, made a very powerful speech and drawing much attention to this much uh, misunderstood but very serious condition. I know my constituents will be grateful uh, to for, for so doing. Um, she's made some very powerful compacts, uh, comments about the PACE trial. Um, I wonder whether she might, in due course, make some comments about the NICE guidelines and the way that they impact upon the way this condition is viewed. The NICE guidelines, and I, I will of course come on to NICE guidelines as well, but the NICE guidelines are currently under review and I think that's something that all politicians can actually help with. I've already written to NICE about this and I would, that's one of the questions I will have for the Minister later. Um, in fact, we, we now know that 13% of the participants in the PACE trial qualified at baseline as recovered or within the normal range for one of the study's two primary measures, self-reported physical function, even as they were at the same time classified as disabled enough on the same measure to enter the study. Now this anomaly, which occurred because the investigators weakened key outcome, outcome thresholds after data collection, invalidates any claim that patients recovered or got back to normal. The overlap in entry and outcome criteria is only one of the trial's unacceptable features. But for patients, the impact of PACE is severe. The recommendation of GET as a treatment for ME has provoked a backlash from patient groups who report that many people with ME end up more severely disabled after a course of GET than before. And I have spoken to people living with ME who have tried to carry out GET because they are so desperate to get better and have found themselves ending up in a wheelchair or bedbound as a result of this programme. I will indeed. I thank my friend for giving way. I congratulate her for securing the debate. I think the, the, the turnout shows <coughs> how significant an issue this is to all of our constituents and I think the point she's making about uh, GET is, is very important. It seems almost perverse that people should be forced to take a course of treatment that is patently making their, making their condition worse. Does she agree this surely has to be reviewed? Indeed and some of the, the 
most upsetting examples. Many, many people have written to me about their experience with GET, but some of the most upsetting examples are children that have been forced through this programme and have ended up with really just life-changing uh, disabilities as a result of this. Yes, I will. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Lady and I'm very grateful to her for mentioning uh, my constituent, Marion Crofts, who I will be speaking about later on in the debate. Um, Marion's mum has said to me that, that Marion was put on GET and it made her condition worse. And uh, it, everything that she is saying is backed up by the testimony that was given to me by Claire, Marion's mum, and I just wanted to, to share that with her. Thank you, honourable friend, for that, that intervention. And um, this, is, this is not an isolated case. Merrin's is not an isolated case. My constituents have been in touch, are not isolated. And, and the members here, I'm sure, have all had uh, constituents getting in touch, actually describing the same situation. But the trial and its CBT and GET recommendations have influenced how health insurers and the DWP make their decisions, with insurance companies refusing to pay out unless a programme of GET has been undertaken. And many who apply for benefits told that they must carry out GET, or indeed that they appear well enough to work. PACE is unique in UK medical history and it was part funded by the DWP and the links that some of the main authors have to health insurance companies is troubling. Now, although Professor Michael Sharp, one of these authors, um, says in his briefing for the debate, several of the investigators had done small amounts of independent consultancy for insurance companies, but this was not relevant to the trial. The insurance companies played no part in the trial. But I'll leave honourable members to make up their own minds about that. <coughs> Healthcare professionals worldwide are now starting to take note. The US Centre for D Disease Control and the Dutch Health Council have both abandoned GET as a treatment. If these countries acknowledge the flaws, why are ME sufferers in the UK having to fight so hard for similar? The hope of the ME community is that when the current NICE guidelines for ME treatment are revised, GET will not feature. Now, regarding cognitive behaviour therapy, or CBT, some will argue that this is provided as a treatment for many illnesses, such as heart disease or cancer, and that ME patients are irrational in their rejection of CBT. The key difference is that cancer patients receive biomedical treatment in addition to CBT, as opposed to ME sufferers having this to the exclusion of any biomedical interventions. Currently, biomedical treatment is woefully lacking. There are reports from the US that certain antiviral drugs improve the condition, but without properly funded research identifying biomarkers for ME, we do not have the answers. Diagnosis currently is based on a patient presenting with known symptoms. Although there's no biomarker for ME, it doesn't mean that there is no biomedical test for ME. The introduction of the two-day cardiopulmonary exercise test, which can objectively document the effects of exercise, could be used as a diagnostic. In simple terms, people with ME perform adequately or even well on the first day, but have reduced heart and lung function on the second day. And that relates to the point about D DWP and the presentation one day being good, but possibly next not being so features of this protocol involve two identical tests separated by 24 hours, collection of gas exchange data, and the use of an exercise bike to accurately measure work output. This type of testing reveals a significant performance decrease on day two in the workload before and during exercise and the volume of oxygen consumed before and during exercise. Results from a single test could be classified as deconditioning and could lead to the exercise, um, the exercise prescription that is so harmful. But the objective measurements of this test remove issues of self-report bias and the question of effort. 
In other words, the results cannot be faked. These results also support strong and consistent patient evidence of the harm that can occur using inappropriate exercise programmes. However, there are currently moves afoot to categorise ME as a psychological condition. NHS guidelines on medically un unexplained symptoms, or MUS, include ME as such a condition. The Royal College of Psychiatrists say medically unexplained symptoms are persistent bodily complaints for which adequate examination does not reveal, reveal sufficient explanatory structural or other specified pathology. I will. I just want to pick up on the point about classifying ME as a psychological condition, which I wonder if she agrees with me that um, is a little curious given that the World Health Organization says on its uh, um, list of uh, the international classification of diseases that ME is a neurological condition, and my understanding is the United Kingdom is legally obliged to follow that classification. Thank the Honourable Gentleman for that intervention. Um, one of the, the really worrying aspects which we should all be aware of is that the WHO are also looking at the reclassification of ME. So we need to be aware of that. And despite the WHO's current classification as of ME as a neurological condition, this has been ignored in terms of the treatment that we have offered to patients here in the UK. The Royal College of Psychiatrists go on to say that symptoms are not due to a physical illness in the body. However, they can be explained, but to do this, we need to think about the causes that are not just physical. And now, under new guide guidance on improving access to psychological therapies for long-term conditions, <coughs> patients who present with ME are classified as having medically unexplained symptoms and should undergo CBT therapy in conjunction with other treatments, i.e. graded exercise therapy. However, as ME is then classified as a psychological condition, patients risk getting trapped in the psychological pathway of care. I will. For giving way. I'm co chair of the Lyme disease APPG. Mm. And does she agree with me that it has many similarities, that patients can be misdiagnosed, mm. not know where to turn, and that we do need to invest in research in both of these important yeah. areas? Mm. Yeah, yeah. There, are, there are many conditions that we now think could be grouped under this sort of wide umbrella of autoimmune um, Lyme's disease, MS, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, ME, could potentially all be grouped in that. But without the research, we don't know that. So there are some who consider ME to be a psychological condition. And this is despite the fact that people with ME are not allowed to be blood or organ donors. Unfortunately, those who hold such beliefs are often in influential positions and are blinkered in their view of the condition. I wonder what they have got to fear from proper biomedical research into ME. If indeed the research shows that they are correct, then their views are vindicated. If, however, this research throws up some new information that can have an impact on ME treatment and care, then surely, as medical professionals, they would support this. Yeah. I'm very grateful to the for giving way, and I congratulate you on securing this very important debate. Is she aware that the UK charity Invest in ME Research has recently opened a centre of excellence for research into ME at the Norwich Research Park? This has been funded by patients and carers, and they've raised a quite staggering £800,000 to carry out what is going to be groundbreaking uh, world-class research. I wasn't aware specifically of, of that centre, but I am aware that almost all the biomedical research currently taking place in the UK is funded by charities and patient groups and not by, um, not by government funding or uh, research council funding. Um, Interestingly, Professor Sharp, who I've already mentioned, one of the authors of the PACE trial, has emailed me this week. He has told me that my behaviour is unbecoming of an MP. So I say to Professor Sharp that if listening to my constituents, investigating their concerns and taking action as a result is unbecoming, then I stand guilty. 
Because if members of Parliament are not willing to stand up for the most vulnerable in society, what hope do any of us have? Exceptionally good point uh, with their speech about the whole of this um, challenge and the number of people in this room uh, testament to the fact that she's led an exceptional debate. Many of my constituents have written to me about this issue specifically. Isn't the, the, the thrust of this that uh, the community, the, the ME community, need to be listened to much wider when they review this, when NICE actually do come back and review this? I, I thank him for that intervention. NICE have said that they will be reviewing their guide, guidelines um, and talking to patient groups and ME charities when they are doing this. And I, I really, I think we have to continue to urge them to ensure that this actually is the case because those who are living with ME are those best placed to talk about how the current guidelines impact them and what they want to see in future guidelines. Grateful for her giving way. Shouldn't grade exercise therapy be removed as a treatment option even before the NICE guidelines uh, are, are, are reviewed. Given the evidence that people are being harmed by GET, and the Minister is hearing that today, that evidence today, isn't there a possibility that a future court could compensate ME sufferers if they continue to be prescribed GET, given we know that evidence, the Minister knows that evidence, and medical professionals know that evidence? Thank you for that intervention. One of, one of the big issues we have is the real lack of awareness amongst many in the healthcare profession. I, I don't want to make any criticisms of people in healthcare, particular GPs that are having to be, um, cover many, many different conditions. But this, is, uh, this highlights why GP education has to be increased and awareness of ME. This is not an uncommon condition. So we really need to be looking at this. Um, so what do we need to do now? Well, first, we need properly funded biomedical research into both the causes but also the treatment of those with ME. And I recently asked a series of written questions about the level of funding into biomedical research and the answers, frankly, did not fill me with confidence. Less than a pound is spent annually on each patient, ME patient in the UK. And it gets worse because the response states that this was not solely government funding, but came from a combination of funders, as has already been mentioned, many ME charities. Um, the Scottish Government has just announced £90,000 for a PhD studentship that will support research into the causes, diagnosis and treatment of ME. And it would be most welcome for people across the UK if the UK Government were to follow this lead. I'm pleased that NICE is reviewing its guidelines, but has just been said that our GPs still recommending exercise as a treatment. So I would ask the Minister, how is the Department of Health supporting training for medical practitioners on ME care and treatment? The new guide, NICE guidelines will not be published until 2020. So what representations will the Minister make to NICE to ensure that damaging exercise therapy does not remain the main course of treatment? In the debate on ME in February, I asked the Minister for Care about working with her DWP colleagues to ensure that the new guidelines, that new guidelines are drawn up for dealing with people with ME. I would ask the Minister what progress has been made on this. But most importantly, will the Minister support proper funding for biomedical research into the diagnosis and treatment of ME? I understand that money is not usually ring-fenced for a particular condition, but considering how poorly funded biomedical ME research has been up until now, what steps will the government take to address this? Finally, I wish to thank all the honourable members who have delayed returning to their constituencies this afternoon in order to speak up for all of those with ME. Your support really is appreciated and is welcomed by those here today and by the wider ME community. I would also like to thank ME charities and campaigners who have briefed us all so thoroughly and the Countess of Mar 
for her relentless campaign for improved treatments for ME. ME is a condition that's all too easy for us to ignore. Those afflicted by the condition are often unseen by society. But many, many of the members here today have come because they have been approached by affected constituents. And I want to thank all of those who have brought this condition to our attention. Because ME has a devastating impact, not just on the sufferers, but on the families and the carers too. 250,000 people, but with a far wider impact. And ultimately, as politicians, we have to remember that statistics are simply patients with the tears wiped away. The question is that this House has considered myelagic encephalomyelitis. Uh, Sir Ed Davis. Now, can I start by congratulating the Honourable Lady uh, for securing this debate, uh, and indeed all Honourable Members uh, who are participating. I think it's absolutely essential uh, that we speak for the millions missing. Uh, it's great to see so many uh, in the public gallery uh, today. What I find so shocking about this debate um, is that scientists seem not to want to have this debate. The fact that the Honourable Lady has been written to by a scientist and has been called out, I hope right on Honourable Members from across this House will find shocking. Um, I have seen uh, scientists writing in journals like this, Journal of Health Psychology, calling out the PACE trial. So the idea that the scientists who produce this piece of work have gone unchallenged by other scientists is simply not true. There is a huge amount of evidence, Mr. Rossendale, from the science community, from very eminent people, questioning the whole PACE trials, their methodology, uh, the evidence they used, the way they treated uh, the patients, as the Honourable Lady said. So the idea that we should be using as uh, the only way to consider this, this disease, these nice guidelines built on that, on that uh, very questionable evidence, I think, uh, it's, it's been proven not to be the case. The Honourable Lady did that very well in a, a previous debate in this House. Um, the real concern I have is that the NICE guidelines uh, that are being reviewed, and it's great that they are, that review is going to take some time. It's going to be a long time. I'm sure that's the right process, Mr Rosendale, because we have to get this right. We have to hear, make sure that the voice of ME sufferers is heard. The scoping working groups that have been set up where ME sufferers have been able to participate, that is all really welcome. But the idea that the current NICE guidelines are in practice till October 2020, I find quite scary. Because I've listened to my constituents and I've read about uh, other Honourable and Honourable Members' constituents, and they feel, if they are prescribed that and they go through that, they feel it has made them more ill. Far from helping them, it has actually made them deteriorate. Indeed, I have a constituent who feels that uh, the, the exercise that she was put through, the program she was put through, set her back two or three years. So uh, there is real harm being caused by some of the, uh, the uh, recommended therapies in the current NICE guidelines. And I think if that is the evidence, I'm not a scientist, but that is the evidence from people from ME sufferers, which it seems to me from what I've read is widely shared, then it's up to the minister, working with the chief medical officer and others, to question whether or not the, that, those NICE guidelines should be suspended, at least with respect to GET. Um, because if there is medical prescriptions that GPs, maybe because they haven't been trained, are prescribing following NICE guidelines, um, because ministers and the chief medical officer may not have acted, if, if, if that treatment is being prescribed and it's actually harming people, as I said on the intervention to Honourable Lady, there will be a case in future, if that continues between now and October 2020, people who are harmed to, to go to court and to seek compensation. Now, no one wants that. So to avoid that, surely there must be a way where government ministers working with NICE, working with the CMO, can actually issue guidelines directly to GPs, directly to med medical professionals to say, be careful before you prescribe GET. Uh, ensure that you have read the evidence. 
ensure that you've properly talked to the uh, patient. Because as it says on, on, with lots of drugs and, ph and pharmaceuticals, you know, sometimes there are side effects. Uh, therapy doesn't work for everybody. Where is the warning of the side effects on, in the NICE guidelines? Forget. And I think this is a serious matter, Mr. Rossendale, because there could be people seriously hurt in the period between now and the conclusion of the NICE uh, review. I want to move on to the research question. Looking at work that Invest in ME Research, for example, has done, setting out the calls there have been over two decades or more for research in this country, and the fact that those calls have been ignored, I find actually quite disturbing. Um, it's only been charities uh, that have enabled a, a meagre amount of research to be done. Um, five million pounds was set aside for the PACE trial. Uh, you know, if we could have a small amount of that money to start off real biomedical uh, research uh, into, into, into ME, then I think we were making a step forward. Have to give way. Um, does he share my concern that my understanding is that there are roughly two and a half times more people with ME than with multiple sclerosis, and yet there is 20 times more research on multiple sclerosis than there is on ME. And what little research there has been on ME, the vast majority of it has been on psychological and behavioural studies rather than on the biomedical approach. Well, uh, uh, I share uh, the Honourable Gentleman's concern. I still think we need a lot of research into MS, I should say. Uh, it's, it's not one or the other. But given the incidence of ME, as he rightly says, the case for research into the biomedical aspects, I think is a very strong one. And Invest in ME Research, in their recent report, have a number of proposals, uh, Mr. Rossendale, and they propose, for example, that there is a ring-fenced uh, ring fund of 20 million a year for the next five years for biomedical research. Now, that recommendation comes from a detailed report. It's not just plucked out of the air. That sort of figure, uh, I think, would show that the government means uh, business. Now, I'm aware that ministers can't stand up with the dispatch box. I'm not suggesting the minister is able to do it today and say, yes, of course, uh, we'll direct research monies into this programme. I will myself do it. I know you, uh, the minister can't do that. He has to work with research councils and others to direct the research. I also aware if proposals aren't put forward uh, by uh, researchers, sometimes you can't uh, grant uh, research monies. But, I, but uh, yes, I'll give way. Well, I'm very grateful to uh, the member for giving way because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Invest in ME Research have set up this Centre of Excellence for Research in Norwich, in the Norwich Research Park. And they are planning to create this hub for European biomedical research, which is really, really good news indeed. They already have five PhD students uh, that, that they are also hoping to push out a clinical service uh, uh, which will be consultant-led. So what we have here, we've got the infrastructure, we've got the base for this extra government funding to build on the money that's been raised by both uh, patients and carers. The Honourable Gentleman is, is absolutely right, and it's good that that centre has him championing it uh, today. And it makes the point that I want to wish to make to the Minister mm. that there is likely to be a pipeline of research proposals coming from uh, the centre in Norwich, but also, no doubt, offshooting from research elsewhere, particularly in the United States, who are beginning to get their act together on the research side. So there is a pipeline. So I would urge the Minister to anticipate that to talk to the research councils, to talk with his colleagues, to say, we are going to be ready and we're going to have the funds ready so that when those research proposals come through, as I'm very confident they will, we will back them. And then we can start making process. Please, I ask the minister, don't wait. Don't wait until to see whether they come through before you actually dedicate the money and start pressurising the research councils, because we know that process can take too long. They've already waited, people have already waited too long. I want to conclude my remarks, Mr. Rossendale, with just two points, which um, uh, the Honourable Lady touched on. I just want to underline. The first is the need for respect for patients. Sometimes it seems from the, the stories that I have read that some in the medical profession, and I say some, don't appear to respect patients. They make comments that it's all in people's minds, that they're making it up. I have to say, that is not the way to talk to, to adults. 
uh, a constituent of mine who was talking to last night, who's been suffering from ME, uh, the, she re recently went to see her consultant, and the consultant said, in terms, all ME people are crazy, except you. Now, that did not make her feel very happy. Uh, and I'm afraid that type of uh, 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 view in senior medical people uh, I think is, is, not, is not acceptable. Uh, and I, I hope we will see uh, ministers making clear that they don't expect uh, uh, patients to be treated like that. That links to my uh, final point, uh, is the need for training for doctors. Uh, better guidelines, better training, uh, so they understand that. And I, I am worried uh, in that light that we are seeing pressure for some reclassification of, of ME, uh, and I think that is sending a dangerous signal. And I hope the minister will say in his remarks that the government is questioning that, uh, that classification uh, and putting it on hold, because otherwise that training for doctors won't happen. Uh, the respect for patients won't happen. We won't see the change that our constituents are demanding to see. So I'm looking forward to the minister's remark, but also to contributions of other honourable members. Thank you. Um, order. Uh, as there is a, please sit down. Uh, as there's a lot of uh, colleagues wishing to speak in this debate, I do ask that everyone keeps their remarks within about eight or ten minutes each, if that's possible to do. And for the benefit of the minister and the opposition spokesman, uh, I hope to be able to start the wind-up speeches at four o'clock. Michael Tomlinson. It's a great pleasure to serve under your chairmanship and to contribute so early in this debate. And I too congratulate the Honourable Member for uh, North West Glasgow, I think it is. And the Honourable Member for, for Glasgow North and my Honourable Friend for North Cornwall was right in saying that the number of Honourable Members here in this chamber show the importance of this subject. And I pay full tribute to the Honourable Lady for bringing this debate forward. But Mr Rosendell, I'm particularly pleased to contribute to this debate um, as a patron of the Dorset ME Support Group and to set out some of the work that that group does, and also to give a brief insight into the lives of two ME sufferers in my constituency. Dorset ME Support Group's chairman, Peter Bennett, has been hugely helpful in setting out the challenges that ME sufferers have and face uh, in Dorset. And much of the knowledge uh, that they come from comes from the work that's done in the community uh, in Dorset. Mr Rosendale, there are nearly 400 members spread not just in my constituency but across the whole county uh, and the group provides practical support to their members, uh, friends and family. And I'm just going to highlight three uh, ways that practical support is given. Firstly, uh, there, there are local link groups um, offering informal venues for members to meet and socialise. There's an annual medical lecture um, and all, in addition there's telephone support and personal one-to-one -one support from a self-care coordinator. And it's quite a feat how active the group is, uh, given the charity was set up in 1983 and, and relies on only two part-time uh, employees, as well as, of course, a number of volunteers. Uh, and needless to say, more volunteers uh, and also trustees would be welcome. So if there are any residents in Dorset who are following our proceedings um, and would like to get involved, then I invite them to get in touch. Uh, and I'm sure the Minister, and in fact all members uh, in the Chamber, would wish to join me in congratulating uh, the Dorset ME support group and, and Peter himself, as well as the many other support groups that exist uh, right across the country. Mr Rosendale, I'd like now very briefly to highlight two constituent stories about their journey with ME and how it's affected them um, and also the people around them. The first comes from Megan who is still at school and who has detailed to me how Emmy has impacted her education and her quality of life. And the following extract sets out the huge challenges that she faces daily as a young person with Emmy, and it speaks of the lack of independence um, or control over their lives that some sufferers can face. And she says this, um, I suffer with Emmy, and it has a huge impact on my education. My grades have dropped far below where they should be, and I'm just not very happy at school in general. As a result of my ME, I suffer with low mood and some anxiety more recently, and I've had ME for about 18 months now. 
Mr. Rosendale Megan encouraged me to attend this debate, saying that it would educate you so much on the struggles me and many others face in everyday life. And I'd like to thank her very much for that encouragement and also for taking the time to travel to London today um, and to be witnessing our proceedings this afternoon. One specific point that I'd like the Minister to consider is about raising awareness um, of support groups, not just in Dorset, of course, but across the whole country. Because Me Megan made the very good point that the Dorset ME support group wasn't recommended to her or her family by any medical professional. They had to search it out for themselves. Uh, and again, talking to the M about the ME support group, Megan says, I know that we're lucky in this area to have that, but it's something I really think that should be available to everyone, and I agree with that. And I'd ask the Minister to, to consider what formal mechanism might be put in place to ensure that sufferers and their families are informed about national um, and local groups. But of course, as the Honourable Member for North West Glasgow said, ME doesn't just affect the sufferer, but also has a wide-ranging impact on families, partners and friends. And this next uh, very brief note is from a different constituent of mine who is a family member of a long-term ME sufferer. And she writes, as my daughter suffered from this debilitating condition for many years, I have personal experience of the devastation uh, that it can cause. It came very close to costing both of us our careers, and it certainly changed the course uh, of her life. These very brief snapshots, along with other accounts that we have heard, and doubtless we'll hear in due course, remind us that this condition takes its toll on the quality of life of everyone that it comes into contact with not just the 250,000 sufferers uh, that live with this day in, day out. Mr. Rosendale, my final point is an obvious one, and it's one that's already been made, and that's about the importance um, of research. And whilst there's currently no cure for any, there are treatments that can help to ease symptoms, um, although no one form of treatment may suit every patient. And I'm pleased that the Medical Research Council and the National Institute for Health Research welcome high-quality applications for research into all aspects of ME. And as a result of this, um, I'm told that ME research, uh, there's a £2 million figure that has been invested, but it all, as has already been said, um, this is a very modest amount indeed. Finally, more research into effective treatments is necessary so that ME sufferers in my constituency and across the whole country can live as normal life as possible. Dr. David Drew. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Rossendale, and uh, I'm delighted to take part in this debate today. Uh, it's a very important debate. I thank uh, the Honourable Lady who introduced it, but also the others who signed up to make sure that we got the three hours, which we're certainly going to need with the number of people who wish to speak in this. Now, I owe my knowledge of this to friends who've suffered from this condition. Uh, but more particularly constituents who've written to me uh, very poignant letters about their own experiences, the hurt they suffered where people just would not recognise that they had a condition, whether it's ME or whether we call it CFS or uh, uh, you know, post-viral uh, uh, um, uh, condition, all these different elements make it quite a problematic condition. But I mainly want to thank my uh, constituent, Dr. Charles Shepherd, uh, in the audience today, who's become my friend, uh, who uh, I owe mainly the few words I'm going to say. He's advised the ME Association for many years now, and uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Chowdhury has written the book, and if you've got a few moments, you might like to go through it. I went through it again last night. It will stagger you with some of the things we don't know, but it's not the easiest read, I have to say. It's very technical and very medical, but this is an incredibly technical and medical disease, which is why we don't know enough about it. So I make no apologies for really going through, trying to avoid points that the members already made, um, some of the points that have been made to me by Dr. Shepherd. And again, I would mention Sarah Reid, who is the wife of uh, 
Andy Reid, who was the MP for Loughborough, who has for a long period of time also suffered for ME and has been in touch with me uh, on many occasions about it. To start with the issue of medical education, uh, it is quite clear that GPs in particular have no experience on how to diagnose this disease. So there is a need for training at both undergraduate and postgraduate level to make sure that doctors become more aware of what the condition looks like and ways in which they could begin to treat it. The continuing lack of medical education really adds, as I said, to the misery that uh, constituents have faced. So it, 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 it behoves, dare I say, the minister, and I know he will be tied in the number of things he can say, but to say something about the training programmes that we would expect our doctors to go through. And again, it is vital that this is understood not just at the level of junior doctors, but all the way up through the profession. And we've understood through some of the research arguments, there are still those who are not necessarily as keenly aware and as responsible. I give way to the Honourable Lady. Honourable Member for giving way. Does he agree with me that it isn't just about awareness amongst doctors, but also teachers and employers and the wider community? Mm. Because a lack of knowledge under those sectors is exasperating the conditions that ME sufferers suffer from. And it's causing great distress. Mm. I do, and she makes the point very strongly. All I would say is I'm concentrating mainly on the medical side of, of, of things there. So, again, everybody needs to be more aware because of the numbers. Two in every thousand people now are thought to suffer from, from this condition. Now, we've heard a lot about the PACE trial and the need for the NICE guideline rewrite, so I don't really want to, to labour that point, other than just to say that it is not helpful that we have still diagnosis and treatment suggesting that whether it's a CBT or, or GET is the appropriate way forward and we know for all sorts of reasons that isn't so so again the Minister I'm sure has heard that and we'll want to make some comments about it I give way to Honourable Frank diagnosis. I've got a constituent who was, who was diagnosed with ME but then went for private tests and it turned out to be Lyme disease so it just shows the issues around lack of knowledge and the confusion in the medical profession between these two and other conditions. Thank you. And if you read uh, Dr. Shepherd's book, you'll see some of the issues of where there is overlap with Lyme disease and MS, as the Honourable Lady did, did say. And that's why this whole area needs proper diagnosis uh, and proper investigation of some of the research implications. And I go quickly on to research. I mean, the fact is, as has been made patently clear by the members, most of the research is self-help. Now, that isn't good enough. This is a major condition that is affecting lots of our constituents, and yet they're being asked to raise all the money themselves. That isn't good enough. So we clearly are asking, and again, the Minister will have heard this, that the uh, government itself, but also the research uh, councils, take proper account of giving this the priority it deserves. I'll give way again. The honour of giving way, because I hope you will support my campaign to get this government-funded research into the ME uh, research, Invest ME Research Centre of Excellence in Norwich, because uh, I didn't mention that there's a really good chance of forging first-class links through to not just uh, European biomedical research institutes, but also to institutes in uh, the United States and Asia where other groundbreaking research is being done. So the government should basically support and invest in success. I mean, again, I think that's more aimed at the Minister, but I totally agree with what the Honourable <laughs> Gentleman says. I mean, I gather that the National Institutes of Health in America has begun to grapple with this and begun to put some quite serious funding into it. And, of course, this is an international condition. So we would hope that our own MRC is also able to provide that, that level of, of, of support. Now, again, we've heard about uh, the impact of people who are going for interview for DO, DWP benefits. Uh, it is very difficult, as was made by the point made by the Honourable Lady, to really get those who are ju making judgments on people's condition to understand how variable that condition is and that really does mean that people are going for either ESA or PIP or uh, more recently universal credit account needs to be made of 
when practitioners are making decisions, the, the, the condition is variable. And sadly, all the evidence is that that is not fully understood. And uh, I hope that, again, although this is not the Minister's responsibility because it overlaps with DWP, it's something that he can take back as the uh, measure of what's been said here today, that really DWP needs to be much more aware of what the condition entails rather than make judgments on what they see in, uh, uh, the person performing in front of them. And then lastly, it, 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 I think the most important issue of all is that we all could put pressure on our clinical commissioning groups to be more able to recognise how important it is that they fund ME both in terms of support for the individual patient, but also the way in which they look at what they are doing with how they commission the monies that goes into the services. I mean, clearly this remains a Cinderella subject, and that isn't something with the numbers involved, with the misery people suffer from the condition. That isn't something that is in any way acceptable. So I hope as a result of today, again the Minister will hear this, but perhaps we could all go out and talk to our clinical commissioning groups about what evidence uh, they can provide us with to show that they are properly funding the way in which they treat this condition. Because what has happened in the past, we all know, has been totally unacceptable. Let us hope that there is a better world now and that we can all play our part in making sure that this condition is treated with the seriousness it deserves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Alex Chalk. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I want to pay tribute, as other members have, to the Honourable Lady for Glasgow, Glasgow North West, who's shown great... Um, uh, how, how can I put it, great stamina, as it were, in fighting for this cause and set out the position at the outset with um, great detail and authority. So I don't want to repeat what she said, but just to make a, a few points. I said in the application for the debate that the reason why I thought we needed to have it was because ME has got terrible PR. Now, that was a slightly flippant thing to say, but the real point I wanted to make was this. It is a forgotten illness, and I think it's forgotten really for two reasons. First, because the symptoms are, relatively speaking, uh, intangible. And second, because it has been disparagingly referred to in the past by something that, that stuck, a name that stuck, and the Honourable Lady referred to it as yuppie flu. And so the reason why I think it's important that we debate today is not because there aren't other illnesses out there, of course there are, but because the sufferers, some of whom we see here in the public gallery today, have been voiceless for too long. And it is for Parliament to give them their voice. And I want to take this opportunity to thank those in my constituency. Three uh, really remarkable ladies, Louise Beaton, Linda Hending and Rachel F. Grave, who, with their courage, dignity and stamina, have educated me and have given me the opportunity to speak on their behalf. So... With this opportunity, let's begin by slaying some myths. And the first myth is this yuppie flu point. It is a thing. ME is a thing. The US Institute of Medicine published a report in 2015 which analysed over 9,000 scientific articles about ME. What did it conclude? The primary message of this report, it stated, is that ME, stroke CFS, is a serious, chronic complex and systemic disease. Second, the WHO categorised it, as we've already heard, as neurological under paragraph G93.3. So let the message go out today to those people who may have a dim awareness of this condition. It is a condition, it is recognised as a condition, and it deserves to be treated as a condition. And the Honourable Lady has already referred to the impact, and I'm not going to repeat the points, other than to note this. When we talk about it affecting an estimated 250,000 adults and children in the UK, that's important because it allows us to put it in context with other conditions and the way that they're treated. So just by way of example, there are 11,000 or so new cases of brain tumours each year, according to Cancer Research UK. The late and much missed Baroness Tessa Jowell did a brilliant job of encouraging the government to fund additional research, and none of us, by the way, least of all anyone in the public gallery, would be begrudge that a penny, but £40 million odd pounds has gone into that, 
uh, and it's right to note that the number of sufferers in the UK of ME is considerably more. And I also want to slay the myth about the kinds of people who suffer from these conditions. Well, I happen to know from my own constituency that the people we're talking about are ex-workers for GCHQ, lawyers, uh, former teachers. And it is heartbreaking to see lives curtailed and potential go to waste. The symptoms have already been referred to, but bear emphasis. Post-exertional malaise, muscle and joint pain, cognitive difficulties, noise and light sensitivities, digestive problems. We know all that, but there's one additional point that I wanted to take this opportunity to mention. Although ME patients, contrary to another myth, are no more likely to suffer from poor mental health or emotional problems than the general population, adults with ME are six times more likely to die by suicide. Mm. Six mm. times more likely. So when one considers the impact of the uh, conditions that have been referred to very expertly by the Honourable Lady of noise and light sensitivities. Well, you might be forgiven for saying, well, all right, no, it's not that serious, is it? But when you, with the cumulative effect, it's so oppressive that it can lead people to take their own lives. And so really, in the time left available, I, I just want to underscore two points. On this issue of welfare benefits, the overwhelming majority of respondents to an uh, Action for ME survey about welfare benefits felt that assessors had insufficient expertise. And, and we, we, of course, understand that assessors can't be expected to be experts in every single condition, but they do need to understand in respect of ME that the way that someone presents on a single day could present an entirely misleading uh, um, picture of their conditions. Why? Because the sheer effort of going to present themselves on that occasion can have long-term implications, and also the effects can be cumulative. So people have good days and bad days, and that variability is not currently taken into account sufficiently, and it must be. The second point, in respect of the NICE guidelines, it's been very well traversed by other honourable members, and I don't seek to say anything further other than to add this. To so those clinicians and experts who say follow the evidence, of course they're right. Most of us in this chamber believe in experts. We value experts and we value expert evidence. But patient experience is also evidence. And it is quite wrong to somehow put it into a category of material that you can somehow overlook or indeed disparage. So it does seem to me that there is an overwhelming body of material which suggests that the uh, guidelines from 2007, uh, which happily are now being reviewed, have to be seen in the context of, of a large body of evidence from uh, patients that suggest they're not working as they should. So patient evidence is evidence. That's the key point. And then the final point I want to make is in respect of research. So... Um, in the United States, there is a huge amount of research taking place. And the key thing I want to raise is this, because there will be those who say, well, there will be those who say, well, look, public money is extremely precious, public resources are precious. Absolutely right. But what we know from the United States is that it is having an impact. So work in the United States has led to new insights into the metabolic, immunological, and neurological abnormalities, abnormalities of ME. And so... Although the DHSE have repeatedly cited a lack of high-quality research proposals for the lack of investment, I hope that they will be able to take into account what is coming from the United States to give them some encouragement that there is scope for real advances. And I am going to underscore the point that £40 million is going into brain cancer research following the wonderful advocacy of Dame Tessa Jowell, but that just places the lack of investment into MB in a rather sharp focus. So I want to conclude, please, Mr. Rosendale, by saying I pay tribute to the silent sufferers in our country uh, who have suffered from this cruel disease. Let the word go out from this House of Commons, they shall be silent no longer. Mm. Jim Shannon. Rosendale, it's a pleasure to speak in this. And, um, first of all, congratulate the, the Honourable Lady for Glasgow North West for putting a, forward a, a very comprehensive, very compassionate yeah. uh, um, the case on behalf of the ME sufferers, uh, and, and I congratulate her for doing it so well and for uh, calculating. Our, our constituents will be very proud of her today, and, and be assured of that. Um, as, as one over the years who, who uh, has had the opportunity to speak on behalf of ME, uh, I, I, one of the frustrations I've had as a, 
in my former life as a councillor, but also as a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly before I came here in, in 2010, uh, was uh, when you were filling in DLA forms as it was then for your constituents, and you put on the DLA form ME, and you went to the doctor, your GP, and you said to the GP, I need a wee letter to support this person, and they've got ME, and the doctor would say, they've got what? Uh, they've got um, ME, and they have to explain it. Uh, that's, a, that's in the past, of course. Thank, thank goodness, thank the Lord, it's in the past. We have now had, over the last period of years, a better understanding from GPs and doctors in my constituency anyway, I have to say, honestly, uh, and they've come round from not understanding ME to understanding it. So when you fill a form in, you get the form filled in right. When you get a letter or you want a support letter, you get that happening as well. So it's, it's, it's very important. It was my pleasure to go along to and support and the Honourable Lady at the Bike Bench Committee to ask for this debate as well, and therefore I wanted to come along and make a contribution. Would, would you give yeah, me on that? Absolutely. Uh, Thank my honourable friend for giving way on that point and actually I, I should have paid tribute to oh. all the members who supported the application for this debate and to like the honourable member for Strangford came along to make representations to the backbench business committee and I see a number of them um, here this afternoon so thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're all very, always very pleased to support the honourable lady and what she comes forward in the backbench committee. Um, but anyway, the, the issue is very emotive. I have many constituents who have contacted me in anger and frustration, out of hurt, as they simply feel that their illness is not understood, and there is no desire to have an understanding by successive governments, say that very respectively, and indeed by some in the health department, and, and, and we under, I understand that and, and for the concert will say that health is devolved. I'm not saying that this is the case. Uh, this is the case in every case, but certainly how numerous constituents have said they feel. Um, and, and we are fortunate today to have a minister in place who has a, a deep interest in this subject matter um, and who is in deep conversation with his, uh, with his <laughs> PPS at the moment time, but will turn around shortly and, and, and be aware of, that, of, of my contribution to him. Uh, and and I, I'm very sure that the minister will, will, will respond in a very constructive um, uh, method. I begin by asking, um, I'm sorry, by thanking ME Action, Action for ME, and there's lots of them. Uh, ME Association, the ME Trust, the Blue Ribbon for Awareness of ME, Centre for Welfare Reform, Forward ME, ME Research UK, WMES, Hope for Me and Fibro in Northern Ireland in particular. All of those groups, all of those uh, organisations ha have furnished us with, with lots and lots of information um, and, and, and I thank them. And I particularly would like to thank one lady, uh, uh, Sally Birch from my constituency, who, is, uh, who has uh, made sure that I had all the details and the information that, that, that helped me. She's also one of those ladies who, who comes to see me regularly and fills me in with all the details. ME is a chronic, fluctuating <coughs> neurological condition that causes symptoms that, that physically affect many body symptoms. Uh, systems, more commonly the, the nervous and immune system, and affects an estimated 250,000 adults, as they, others have already said as well. And children in the UK don't just think it's an adult uh, uh, um, a problem or, or illness, because it's not. Uh, there are approximately 7,000 people with ME in Northern Ireland, and some 17 million worldwide. Um, a very few of the hospital-based... Happy to give way, yes, absolutely me to intervene. He's right to raise the issue of children with ME and of course one of the impacts is on their education and the lack of access to consistently uh, available home education where that is necessary. Does he agree that that is something uh, that the Minister might want to take up with colleagues in the Department for Education? I, I thank the Honourable Lady for that intervention. It gives me a chance just to, to say to her that I, I've had, had constituents and, and who had to have be homeschooled for the very simple reason that they, that they have ME. So uh, I'm, I'm aware of the, of the illnesses, just not affecting adults, but affecting children. And I've seen the, 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 the effects for, for their education as well. Thank the Honourable Lady for, for uh, that intervention. Uh, very few of the hospital-based ME services provide a domiciliary home visiting service for people who are unable to attend an outpatient department. There is now only one hospital service that is dedicated inpatient beds for the assessment and management of people who require a hospital admission to a ward with a staff of experience in dealing with this condition. Specialist uh, services for ME are scarce and under-resourced, as many have said. The situ situation is, I'm ashamed to say, in relation to Northern Ireland, my own home nation, um, that there are no services in Northern Ireland, which makes it all the worse. Uh, we have a non-functioning assembly, uh, as, as many will know, and it means that the, of trying to initiate something to happen is even more difficult now than it, than, it, than it has been in the past. It is my belief that the only way of getting the attention and dedication that is needed to treat ME is by saying that it is correctly classified, and that, that is not what has happened up to this stage. The briefing provided so much information um, 
it's impossible to go into all the details in the short time we have, and, I, and I'm not going to uh, uh, try to do that. But I need to highlight that my constituents have raised with me the problem with the 2007 PACE trial. The 2007 National Institute for Health and Care Excellence recommended graded service therapy and CBT for patients with ME. The guideline was based on a weak evidence from small trials, and so the much larger PACE trial was designed as a definitive test of these uh, therapies. PACE trial cost some £5 million. Pound Funded mostly by the Medical Research Council, with uniquely some funding from the Department for Work and Pensions. PACE researchers reported that with cognitive uh, behavioural therapy and graded service therapy, approximately 60% of patients improved and 22% recovered. Treatments were claimed to be moderately effective and safe. However, PACE claims ran counter to, uh, to patients' knowledge and lived experience. My constituents, those who told me that this wasn't how it really was, and, and, and I want to uh, dwell upon that, leading some to examine the, tri the, 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 the trials uh, methods. Those who did found two considerable problems. Objective results were poor. After a year of therapy, the graded services therapy groups increase in walking speed was less than half that achieved in three weeks in a sample of class 2 chronic heart failure, patients receiving graded exercise. So the, the, the trials were, were, were sus suspect whenever we got the information. And after the trial had finished, the PACE authors lowered the threshold they used. I mean, you almost, yeah, you almost took the, the figures and then you manipulated them to get what you wanted. Yeah. Uh, so, so, and the definition of improvement. This included the number of participants' classes either recovered or improved. In some cases, even patients whose condition had deteriorated during the trial were classed as recovered. But, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, I, I believe in miracles. But uh, miracles happen and I know they do, but this isn't one of them. Uh, because people had not recovered. Uh, after spending over 200,000 fighting a freedom of information request, Queen, uh, Queen Mary University in London, a PACE's data custodian, had to share access to the data. Subsequent reanalysis re have shown changes to the criteria for recovery and improvement distorted the results. This was all highlighted to me during a constituency meeting with Sally Birch, with other uh, ME sufferers, uh, and, and wonderfully intelligent uh, constituent of mine who had noted the questions that I had asked uh, and, and the questions that I'd written to the Minister and the letters I'd written to the Minister uh, regarding this trial at Westminster. She explained her day-to-day -day life. I knew her day-to-day -day life because day -day I knew her when she was a healthy person. So now that she wasn't, I, I could very clearly see the difference. Uh, and, and she explained that, the, that her, her treatment and care is not acceptable. Hope for ME and Fibro Northern Ireland, which is she is as a, as a member of, and many of my constituents are, have underlined their opinion on this and the need for ME inclusion in the, in the medical curriculum after the charity hosted an ME educational event on the 24th of May of this year at Queen's University in Belfast. Nearly 400 medical students attended, as did many lecturers, all with the same interest in ME, all to see uh, what, how do we go forward, what does this, this PACE trial do, and, and does it help us? And if it doesn't help us, then let's, let's highlight that. The results of the charity questionnaire are very revealing and clearly demonstrate the, the desperate need for ME to be included in the medical curriculum. Uh, other members have spoken, and other members will speak on the on the need for research. And I think, uh, Minister, today, if we're looking for for uh, one particular issue out of it, we're looking for many answers. Of course, we always are, uh, but we're looking for help for the research as well. And, and, and perhaps, when, in response, Minister, you can give us that that uh, encouragement that we need. Uh, this is a very serious uh, illness, uh, which seriously affects so many in our communities. These people are not lazy. I must not be made to feel like that. To say to an ME sufferer, get up and have a walk, and you will be, will be fined as tantamount to say to someone with a bullet in his leg, stick a plaster on it, ignore the blood flowing down, and sole your own. This does not work and is not <coughs> helpful, and, and that's clearly the message we must make. And we in this place must ensure that there is an appropriate form of diagnosis and care. This is not the current situation uh, to the way that I would like it. Therefore, I am fully supportive of the calls of the Honourable Lady for Glasgow North West. And what she has made today on behalf, but on behalf of my constituents, on behalf of all constituents across the whole of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, uh, I'm certainly uh, not, I, I'm not asking simply for words of understanding from the Minister, but for action to be taken to change the get up and get on with it mentality into I will help you get up and get on and, and find a way to facilitate an, an easier way of living your life. Now, that's what we want today out of this debate. It's to highlight it, it's to show what the problems are, and to look to the minister with with um, um, with, with a plate, like almost like Dick Solian has done in the past. But we need the minister's help to make this happen for those, and we need something practical, something that can help, 
and will help and give encouragement to our constituents and to all those across, ME sufferers across the whole of the, this great nation of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Thank you. Harry McCarthy. Day, partly because constituents have been in touch and asked me to, but also because I have a very good friend who's been affected by ME since about the age of 15, and she's in her early 40s now. And when I say affected by ME, that means that she um, didn't go on to college, she has never held a job, she isn't at the worst end of the spectrum of severity, but I think I could probably best describe her condition as just almost constantly feeling rough. So it's like either having flu or migraines or aches and pains and just being aware of that. Obviously, it's, it's one thing to read up on the condition or to hear um, accounts from constituents that come to see me. And I've had constituents both with ME and fibromyalgia, um, which is a similar condition, um, come and talk to me. But when you've got a very close friend and you know that every time you try to make a social engagement, it will always be, well, Lucy will come if she's up to it that day. And, um, you know, we're all planning to watch the football together on Sunday. We won't know till the morning whether Lucy is actually well enough. And half the time when she does come along, you can tell that she's actually struggling through a migraine or through flu. Um, but she just desperately wants to see her, her friends. And it really does bring home to you um, just how debilitating a condition this is. And as the Honourable Member for Cheltenham said, is that cumulative effect? You know, people make such a big deal of having a cold or, you know, or just feeling a bit under the weather or feeling hungover. And this is just like feeling like that for most of the time. And obviously um, there are other people that um, are completely bedridden, um, can't bear to lights and that. I had um, uh, a member of staff whose um, younger brother came to her wedding in a wheelchair because he had ME. So there, it affects people in many ways. But I think in some ways the, the cruelest impact of it is the fact that people are not believed and that it is a hidden illness, so to speak. The organisation Missing Millions, the uh, an ME campaign group recently held an event in Bristol where friends and relatives of those with ME laid out pairs of shoes to represent some of those who are suffering from the illness, which renders them invisible. And they read out stories of the battles that their friends and family had gone through and their determination to see real change happen. The organisation Action for ME um, used to be based in the centre of Bristol, is now just outside. And I think what's um, what really strikes home is when you look at their raison d'etre on their website, it says they're there to take action to end the ignorance, injustice and neglect faced by people with ME. Most other campaign groups for conditions, they don't have to start from that side. It might be to um, uh, raise awareness of what, you, what, what the symptoms are of a condition or make calls for treatment, but to actually have to start from the point of view of um, the sort of injustice and neglect because so many people actually deny that this condition exists, I think, um, just shows how, how much of a battle we have on our hands. As we've heard, and I thought it was an, um, an excellent speech by the Honourable Member for Glasgow North West, ME affects um, around 250 thousand people. Um, I just want to cite one of my constituents who contacted me to stress the um, lack of support and understanding they've received from medical professionals and there are many people where it takes a long long time to get a diagnosis because of this. Um, the constituent got in touch to share the story of her close friend's 28 year old son who's had ME for the, the past couple of years. She said the impact on his life has been catastrophic. He was a highly skilled and highly valued journalist for a national newspaper with a busy and vibrant professional and social life. Since contracting ME, he has been unable to work and is living at home with his parents who act as his carers. He has severely limited energy, he's in constant pain and has obtained no relief or satisfaction from the treatments currently available through the NHS, his GP and the specialist to whom he's been referred. His parents have actually been left to research and self-fund investigations and treatment themselves, and this is plainly not good enough. In Bristol, we do have a um, CFSME centre, but this has no doctors and focuses primarily on training in activity management. Um, one of my constituents who received treatment there was highly complimentary of the staff, but she echoes the view of many other patients that occupational therapy is an inadequate approach for people with a highly disabling multi-systemic disease. The current NICE guideline, which recommends treatment consisting of graded exercise therapy 
and CBT has been criticised by all ME charities, patient organisations and representatives registered with NICE as stakeholders. And we've heard from uh, a few people uh, about that. <laughs> Fifteen-year-old that finds the graded exercises very debilitating and actually making her condition worse, which has been echoed by the ME charities and community. Does she agree with me that we do need to look at that again in the new NICE guidelines? Yeah, I think so much concern has been expressed about graded exercise therapy, and many um, patients prefer uh, the concept of pacing, which is balancing activity and rest to help manage their ME and work towards recovery. Um, that's not currently recommended by NICE. I very much hope that the Minister picks that up, because I think it is probably the most controversial issue around the um, treatment of uh, ME at the moment. I, I welcome NICE's decision to review their guidelines, which we're expecting, I think, October 2020, and I would urge them to listen to the voices of patients. Um, we have heard about um, biomedical research during um, and the, the decades of underinvestment in that research um, from other speakers. Um, we've heard that it's the average research spend per person living with ME is less than one pound a year, and that much of that is provided by charities rather than government. And if you look at the economic cost of not finding a way to, for at least people to be able to manage a condition like ME, if ideally to find the cause of ME and to find a cure for ME, um, this is clearly unacceptable. Um, way, she, she made a very important point there about the decades of underinvestment. Um, a friend of mine, uh, John Peter, suffers from ME and was first struck down in the 1980s. Now he, the, the impact on his life has been total. Now he acknowledges that he wouldn't have been able to do everything in life. He knows that there would have been ups and downs. But as he quite painfully put it to me, you know, he hasn't had the chance to fail. Mm. You know, his is a life unlived. And so given that decades of underinvestment, it makes it so important that we now change it for the future. Yeah, and I think, um, I think this is the problem that we see over and over again with Nike, is how do you value quality of life in a way... You, you can look at the economic costs that are lost as well if this is somebody who's had to spend a lifetime on benefits rather than working and paying taxes. But there is so much more that they perhaps could have contributed to society, and that um, opportunity has, has simply been lost. Just um, in the time that's left to me, Mr Rossendale, I just want to mention the benefit system, and um, we've already heard from other people. Um, it's, it's just time and time again we see this, that the assessments for employment support allowance for PIP just cannot cope with people who have fluctuating conditions um, or people who might be able to fulfil the tests but feel absolutely dreadful afterwards. And again, my friend went and was, you know, scored zero, I think, on the test because she was trying to be as honest as possible. And if she was asked if she could walk up a flight of stairs, well, yes, she could. But on a bad day, she'd probably taken an awful long time and collapsed in a heap at the top of the stairs. And uh, she was actually, one of the reasons she was turned down when she went for the face-to-face -face assessment, they said, well, you look very presentable and you've, you've washed your hair. And um, I know there are days at a time when she's bedridden and isn't washing her hair, but clearly if she's dragged herself out for an assessment and she's, she's well enough to go to the assessment that particular day, she's going to try and look, you know, not like, um, you know, sort of like she's just got out of bed. Um, so... Um, does she agree with me that, you know, these questions are, are entirely unsuitable for people with many conditions, but Amy in particular, mm. can you walk up a flight of stairs? Yes. They're not interested in the but after, yeah. but it wipes me out for three weeks yeah. afterwards. That, that doesn't figure in these, these questions. Yeah, and we've actually absolutely got to get to a system where rather than it being tick box exercises, yes or no, it's got to be sensitive to... The, the, the people that are doing it. One of the things I think was really interesting, the evidence that Action for ME gave to the Work and Pension Select Committee when it did an inquiry into ESA and PIP um, towards the end of last year, they cite one case study, and it was from a man who um, could, was, was registered blind as well. He could only just perceive some light. And he said, um, I'm not disabled by blindness in comparison to living with ME, no, sorry, I'm not disabled by blindness. In comparison to living with ME, my blindness is just an inconvenience. When it came to being assessed, of course, his blindness scored maximum points, but his ME didn't register at all. And he was saying, well, actually, 
with my blindness, I can still go out and walk with my dog, but it's the ME that means that I'm housebound. Um, with blindness, I can hear, I, you know, I can have those audio books, perhaps, or, um, but my ME means that I just can't con concentrate for any period of time. But yet one is accepted as something that's a, a disabling condition and the other is not. Um, so to conclude, and I, I think, um, uh, you know, as one ME campaigner put it, there's this perception that ME is just about being tired all the time. But one ME campaigner said comparing ME to being constantly tired is like comparing taking a shower to drowning. Um, I was going to mention the case of Merrin Cross, but I know we've got the Honourable Member for Haywood and Middleton, who's our MP, um, here. And I, I think that's clearly an incredibly tragic case, a uh, second person ever in the UK to have ME recorded as the reason for death on her death certificate. Um, but I, I will conclude instead by mentioning the documentary Unrest, um, which I attended a screening of. Jennifer Breyer, 28-year-old ME sufferer. Um, basically documented her condition herself with a camera when doctors told her her illness was all in her head. Using Skype, she connects with others around the globe who are suffering with ME and documented their plight. It's a really powerful and moving documentary about the realities of life for many people with severe ME, and I would encourage anyone who is looking to gain a better understanding of the illness to watch that. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle Donnellan. Oh, okay. Stephen Kerr. Mr. Rosendale, it is a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And can I begin by paying tribute to the Honourable Lady, the member for Glasgow North West, for her leadership and this campaign, which she is doing such a superb job of, of leading. And, and, and whoever the, I can't remember now the name of the gentleman, the, the academic that wrote to her, um, chiding her, reproaching her for the stance she'd taken in relation to this campaign. But I would uh, say, and I think I say it on behalf of all of us, that what she is doing is exactly what an MP should be doing, and shame on anyone who would say otherwise. I specifically compliment her uh, on her presence at the recent Edinburgh event on the hashtag uh, Millions Missing Global Event Day, a uh, day of action, sorry. Um, the purpose of that event was to raise awareness, it was to highlight the need for support for ME sufferers, and it was to call for investment in healthcare and biomedical research. And I think, in a sense, that's an excellent summary to the purpose of this particular debate. Already mentioned was the nature of that event with the, every participant invited to bring a pair of shoes. But what touched me deeply in the publicity for the event was that the symbolism of this, these pairs of shoes was to show the millions of patients who are missing from their lives because of this devastating disease. And the phrase, missing from their lives, deeply touched me. And so I rise just for a few moments to highlight the experience of those who are impacted by ME. As my honourable friend said, their evidence is compelling and should be of a primary consideration. It's been upsetting for me to hear how many pe people, including those in the medical profession, are unaware or just lacking in detail of understanding of ME. Um, many uh, persist in believing that this disease is some form of uh, mental illness or a neuro neurological disorder. And indeed a constituent in Stirling told me as recently as 2011 they were told there is no such thing as ME after they had collapsed at work. And she has since been diagnosed with severe ME. And there are so many distressing stories about the treatment of people who are suffering from ME. Another of my constituents was told repeatedly by different doctors that her ME was a psychological problem and was referred on multiple occasions for psychological assessments. And it took her two and a half years to get a proper ME diagnosis. Thank you for giving me. Does he sh share my concerns about this um, aspect, the medically unexplained symptoms, which is diverting ME down the psychological path. Yeah, absolutely, I do, I do agree with her uh, in the point that she raises and thank her for her intervention. Um, I cannot speak too highly of Helen Highland of the ME Association, who is a constituent of mine, who has done so much to raise awareness of the condition across the UK in her role within the ME Association. She's done so much as well to educate me as her Member of Parliament about this disease. 
because soon after my election as Member of Parliament for Stirling, Helen reached out to me to inform me about what I could do to help the campaign. And I'm very grateful that my office, myself, have been able to work with her to highlight ME to GPs in Stirling constituency. I'm not terribly sure how they have responded to a letter from their Member of Parliament advising them to be careful of how they diagnose those who have the symptoms of ME, but I'm sure that's a different story. Helen has been involved with the ME Association since her husband took his own life, a year after being diagnosed with ME. The way she told her children of her husband's passing outlines how hard ME is to cope with. She said, and I quote, imagine, our children are very small at the time, imagine a Doctor Who monster getting inside and taking over daddy's head and body. The harder daddy fights, the harder the monster fights back, and the monster always wins. For people with ME and those around them, the diagnosis is crucially important to be told that you have a medically recognised condition is a validation of them. And yet there is so little, still so little known about this illness. There's no easy way of diagnosing it. There's no clear treatment and there's no known cure. And this is what has to change. I will, along with many others, continue to support the ME Association and any campaign which pledges itself to com combating ME. I'd like to turn now to the first-hand account of a lady called Jules Smith, who wrote to me and asked me to have her voice heard in the debate this afternoon. And I do this because her story, as touching as it is, is not her story alone, but the story of many others. For over 10 years, she, write, she wrote to me, I was a therapist and devoted my life to helping others as best I could. I first became ill about eight years ago, but kept going, putting down the general aches and pains, setting, sorry, but kept going and put it down to general aches and pains. I finally had to give up what I loved doing in November 2016 and had the final diagnosis of severe ME in May 2017. I've been to psychology to be told it's all in my head, pain management to be told to push through the pain and physiotherapy who told me my muscles were so weak there was nothing they could do. I've been on so many prescribed med medications and vitamins. Last year I was taking in excess of 22 tablets a year and yet I would still crash. I am 90% house and bed bound and my GP has exhausted all avenues for me. Therefore, as I was told, quote, you must try and manage your illness as best you can, unquote. I had been told that graded exercise therapy would help me starting off by stretching and then low impact sports like walking. I'm an ex-runner who was capable of running a 10k every week so I was familiar with pushing through the pain barrier and grading my exercise but it has made me more severe. I feel like my life is just wasting away. I get all my prescription medicines on the feet. I get a telephone appointment with my GP every once in a while and that's it. My husband works long shifts with the Scottish Prison Service and I'm home alone at least 10 hours a day. Sometimes I have to crawl on my hands and knees to get to the, the bathroom and I can go days on end without being able to bathe or shower as I'm just too exhausted to move. I feel like so many others that we are just left to rot. I feel like my mental health is now suffering as I become more and more isolated from society and there's no one to help me and many others like me. I am severely fatigued to the point that I cannot stand upright, otherwise I get so dizzy I'm about to faint. I also have severe laboured breathing and there's nothing recommended but rest and resting doesn't cure ME. I don't wallow in self-pity. I spend what time I can online being an advocate for action for ME and millions missing Scotland. And whenever I can, I offer support to other members of the social media groups that I am in and share my story and experiences. I have a devoted and caring husband who does everything he physically can to look after me, but it's tough when I'm home alone for so long with no care. I try to do what I can to keep my spirits up, but on days when I crash for no reason and I can't watch TV or read a book, I have, 
I have to have my curtains drawn and be in a dark room. Sometimes I even need soft silicon earplugs to block out any noise as I get cognitive dysfunction too. This, she wrote to me, this is not living, Stephen. This is just existing. May I thank Jules for allowing me to share her story in this debate. And I am grateful and feel privileged that I was allowed to let her voice heard today in Parliament. Elvin Hopkins. Thank you, Mr. President. Pleased to serve under your chairmanship. May I first say what a moving and graphic speech that was just from the Honourable Gentleman. And I'm so pleased I was here to hear it. I should speak very briefly because much of what I would have said has been said already, but I want to add my voice to all those demanding that um, we take ME seriously and that in future doctors, the medical profession, will do what they can to first to find out what causes it and try to deal with, the, deal with that, uh, but also to make the, the, their lives bearable and try to find cures if we possibly can. I first became aware of ME some 30 years ago when I had two young relatives who, um, fairly close relatives, not in my immediate family, who uh, contracted ME um, and suffered for a long time during their childhood and youth. Um, uh, their condition is much improved now, but uh, I became aware of the lack of belief in ME by the medical profession um, because constantly they were told there was a psychological problem, it wasn't a, it wasn't a medical or physiological problem, uh, and, and we now know better. But unfortunately, there have been uh, discredited research by, by Pace and, uh, and, and others, no doubt, which is now being, I think, uh, dismissed, but not before time. But the you know, medical, medical profession and indeed governments will grasp at things which uh, encourage them to do nothing, not to take <coughs> some, a sub, some, to do something which is very difficult. And dealing with it is very difficult. We've heard also from the Honourable Lady who's recently left, and she's, she's the co-chair of the, the, the Lyme, Lyme, Lyme disease group, which I also belong to because I had a very dear friend who suffered terribly from Lyme disease, was not diagnosed for years, and she suffered terrible psychological and, and physical problems, marital breakup, and so on. Um, and if people are not diagnosed properly and not given the proper treatment and indeed sympathy, then they, then they can suffer even worse than, 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 than uh, their disease. Um, the conditions obviously vary enormously. Some are, 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 are uh, the symptoms are very different, um, and some, of course, suffer great severity, very severe symptoms. In my constituency, I had one constituent who, like so many others, could not get could not get out of bed for long periods. Had to live in a darkened room because could because I, I, looking at light was too was too was too painful. Um, and and we've, we've heard the idea that people like that would have their condition dismissed as some sort of psychological phenomenon is complete nonsense and utterly cruel. Um, but uh, as, I, as I say, I, I, I have taken up um, this issue in, in, the, in, in the recent past, prompted by an old friend, Dr Ian Gibson, who was a Member of Parliament for one of the Norwich seats, uh, and he uh, wrote to me about the PACE um, research, dis, dis, dismissing it as nonsense uh, and speaking in very strongest terms. And I, I, he asked me to put down a series of parliamentary questions, which I did. Uh, and I like to think they had some, you know, had some in, influence on, on government government thinking. And hopefully, the minister will recognise the this depth of feeling and the appalling way ME sufferers have been treated for so long, and start to really take 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 steps to 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 correct that that in the past. We are used to having experts tell us things and deferring to them. And we, rightly, in many cases, we do defer. But, of course, sometimes experts get it wrong. Doctors, I mean, if one go about 60, 70 years, some doctors were known to recommend uh, patients t to take up smoking because it would be good for their health. Well, you know, not some, no doubt some of those died of lung cancer later on, but that was a, a terrible thing to do. Um, Maybe some of those doctors uh, should have felt uh, rather, rather guilty about that afterwards. But it was a particular case of the, in the 1960s, there was a noted, very famous psychologist who wrote books, which was regarded as, it was regarded as sort of Bibles but by, by young people, about, about psychiatry. His view was that there was no such real thing as in mental ill health. It was just a different way of viewing the world. Well, he was famously debunked by a, a, a group of people suffering from from, from schizophrenia, who, who in, in a, when he was speaking at a conference with schiz, uh, to an audience of schizophrenics, they got up and said, you're trying to tell us we're well, we're telling you we're not. 
Now, when people are suffering, as indeed people do suffer, and I've been constantly being told they're actually well and they're all just putting it on, or it's a, an alternative way of viewing the world, which is what, what he was saying. Interestingly, that, that famous psychologist, at the end of his life, he recanted, he recanted publicly on the radio. After no doubt, he caused much suffering to many people through his life. So we, we must always, I think, make sure that evidence is properly based, that s statistics uh, are, are properly uh, measured. And we've had a paper circulated to us before showing the statistic, this paper statistics, which is false. They just didn't, they didn't work. Uh, we want, first of all, more resources put into, into, into uh, dealing with um, the, the, the research uh, uh, to make sure that people, that the research is done uh, and that ME sufferers are, are properly supported both financially and indeed medically in the future. We have to find what causes it. We have to find cures where we can. And we have, hopefully, to make the lives of people who suffer maybe a lot happier in, in future. Um, I, I've um, probably said more, more than enough, just I wanted to add my voice to all of those who, who have spoken so brilliantly today. And in particular, of course, um, our lead speaker, those um, the, the Honourable Lady for Glasgow North West, who's made such a brilliant and eloquent speech, uh, and which I'm sure we're all most grateful for. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Liz McInnes. Thank you, Mr Gates, and it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. And I'd like to thank the Honourable Lady from Glasgow North West for securing this very important debate. Now, Marion Crofts, who has already been referred to in this debate, is one of just two people in the UK who've been given a diagnosis of myalgic encephalomyelitis as a cause of death. She was my constituent, and she lived in Norden, in the Rochdale area of the Hayward and Middleton constituency. I spoke with her mum, Claire, this week, who told me that the reports about Merrin in the newspapers didn't really cover the whole of Merrin's condition. And Claire wanted to be here today to hear the debate, but could not travel to London because of a new baby in the family. So I hope that she is able to watch this debate back home in Rochdale, and I send my best wishes to her and to the new baby. Here, here. And from all of us. And from all of us. <laughs> Claire um, Merrin met all the diagnostic criteria set by NICE and by the Canadian consensus criteria for a diagnosis of ME stroke CFS, chronic fatigue syndrome. Merrin was totally bedbound. She physically could not get out of bed. She suffered so badly from postural hypertension that she blacked out if placed in a sitting position or even if her bed was raised slightly. She was hypersensitive to noise, light, touch and movement. She suffered so badly from pain, head, muscle, neurological, stomach pain, that she could not get out of bed. Her GP said that she herself had worked in a hospice for 10 years, looking after cancer patients, and that in that job, she couldn't always take away pain, but she could manage pain. <laughs> But the GP said that in Merrin's case, her pain was unmanageable. Although Merrin was on diamorphine and ketamine, she was still in pain. And any kind of stimulus, even just a nurse walking into the room, was an exertion to Merrin. Merrin was permanently on syringe drivers and receiving injections. She was permanently nauseous. The terms ME and chronic fatigue syndrome are often used interchangeably, but Merrin's mum tells me that fatigue was the least of Merrin's symptoms and that in her view, the use of the term chronic fatigue syndrome should be abandoned as myalgic encephalomyelitis is so much more than just fatigue. Merrin was only 15 years old when her illness started. For the first year, she was not housebound and she used to go out in a wheelchair. But as her condition worsened, she became unable to go out. She went from a young girl who loved life, her passions were drama and acting, to a housebound patient whose family had to do more and more for her. Even things like chatting on her behalf on social media, simple things which she was no longer able to do on her own. And I mentioned social media because Merrin was helped a great deal by the online ME community. 
Her mum tells me that Merrin always wanted positive support and was very choosy about who she communicated with. She didn't want to speak with people who exuded negativity. But she was part of a big online ME community, which included people like ballet dancers and sports people, raising the issue of whether research should look at the lifestyles of those who contract ME and look at whether there is a susceptibility which can be exacerbated by leading an active life and pursuing strenuous sports or vocations. And Merrin's mum is very critical of the PACE guidance given by NICE and actually attributes this to the worsening of Merrin's condition. She tells me that Merrin thought that she could push through the condition and keep going, whilst her family really wanted her to slow down. And sadly, it was only when the family contacted a private medical practitioner that Merrin was given the advice to slow down and told that she needed to rest. The specific advice given was, and I quote, whatever you feel you can do, only do 50% of it. Merrin's mum feels very strongly that had Merrin been given this advice when her condition started, that she may not have gone on to develop severe ME, and she strongly urges that the NICE guidelines be reviewed. To quote Merrin's mum, she said, if the PACE trial were a drug, it would have been banned by now. And I hope, and I'm sure that the Minister will, refer to this in his response. Now, Merrin's family are still very involved in the ME community, and they run Merrin's Legacy Facebook page, which raises money for research and includes such fundraising activities as skydiving and climbing Ben Nevis, impressive feats which are done on behalf of the ME community as, representatives, as representative of the things that they would like to do but are unable to because of their condition, and the fundraisers are doing these activities on their behalf. And we do need to invest more in research into ME. The best research, as has already been referred to, is being done in the States. Here, it is very much funded by charities. It tends to concentrate on psychological issues rather than physical changes, such as inflammation of the brain and changes to the central nervous system. And we do need to do much more research into the physical aspect. Nancy Klimas is a major ME researcher based in Miami who has more than 30 years professional experience and has achieved international recognition for her work with ME. And she compares patients like Merrin with severe ME with those in the terminal stages of HIV AIDS infection in terms of the levels of pain that they suffer. And there are many comparisons which can be drawn between HIV AIDS and ME. Because when HIV was first identified, it was thought to be incurable and a certain death sentence. But incredible research has produced advanced treatment with retrovirals, which although they do not provide a cure, can be used to manage the disease and it is no longer the death sentence that it was. In comparison, ME is not seen as a death sentence, but as Merrin's case sadly shows, it can be fatal. It is also described as a kind of living death. But the work done on HIV AIDS shows how powerful good research can be, and I hope that in the future, following investment in ME research, we may also see great advances made in the treatment and the knowledge around ME. We also need to invest more in training for our doctors, especially general practitioners, who are the clinicians likely to be the first port of call for those suffering with ME, and our GPs need to have the skills to be able to recognise the signs and symptoms and to signpost patients to the appropriate specialists. And I do hope that the Minister may be able to refer to these points in his response. And I am immensely grateful to Merrin's family for sharing so much with me and allowing me to tell her story. Luke Pollard. Thank you, Mr Gapes. Um, I want to thank the uh, Honourable Member for Glasgow North West for, uh, for tabling this debate and for speaking so passionately. And I stand with her yeah, and with all those people affected by ME in not allowing the voices of ME sufferers to be silenced by anyone for any reason. Um, 
ME effects uh, in Plymouth uh, between 500 and 1,500 people. And I agree with the sentiments that have been expressed by so many people in, in this chamber today that it does not get the amount of attention it deserves. In many cases because of the stigma that has been attached to it for far too long. I've heard people shrug off this condition as, as being about being lazy or it being about something in people's heads. And attacking the stigma and those people who peddle that stigma needs to be an important part of how we build the case for proper action on ME. I, table, I put on my Facebook page uh, a few days ago uh, that I wanted to speak in this debate and I asked for stories from people in Plymouth. And I've done this before in a number of different debates and what has always struck me is the levels of honesty and directness that comes from people simply telling their story, not as a politician, but just as a person. And I want to share some of those stories today, uh, mainly because those uh, speeches before me have expertly and so succinctly explained the problems with the PACE trial, the problem with the conditions we have, uh, the treatments we have currently. So I wanted to make sure that those voices were heard. And there was one word that came through a number of times in nearly all the posts on that Facebook page and on my Twitter, and that was about feeling invisible. That's those people with ME feeling that they're not believed, that their condition doesn't matter, and that nothing is being done about it. And I want to, just in a few brief moments that I have, just address what it means to be invisible and what we can do about it. Jules wrote to me saying, just getting up the stairs lays me out for hours. Having a shower leaves me laid, on the dark, uh, laid out in a darkened room. I can't work anymore. Believe me, it's not for the want of trying. I can't do drama, rock choir, or Zumba. In fact, just making a cup of tea leaves me exhausted as Zumba used to. I lay alone at home. I live vicariously through Facebook. I still get out when I can, but it will usually cost me days or weeks in bed if I do. I'm one of those lucky ones. I'm not totally bed-bound, but I pay for this with my invisibility. I look so well. No one can see my pain. I smile and I say I'm fine, and then I go back to bed. The word invisibility is really key here. It's something that people talk about time and time again in terms of how the condition actually affects their, their lives, their relationships that have been spoken about by my friend from Bristol, and how uh, it is something that often makes people doubt their validity and where they're telling the truth. A number of people told me about how having ME also affects their mental health. And that was spoken about uh, by my uh, colleague from uh, Cheltenham earlier. Catherine said, I first became ill just before my 21st birthday. I spent weeks needing to be cared for full-time by my parents, including being carried by my dad because I was unable to walk. I'm always in pain. I have difficulty doing things that most people take for granted, and I've lost so much of my long-term memory. Long-term, it affects my memory and focus, my ability to function on a daily basis. I'm constantly tired no, how, no matter how much I sleep. I have lost friends and needed to give up a career in teaching that I loved. I walk with a stick much of the time, especially in the winter, because my balance is bad and I fall easily. I suffer depression, bouts of anxiety and problems that are very embarrassing, never knowing when the next flare might put me back where I started. And I think the story about how ME is not just one thing on its own and mental health problems can stem from the experience of living with ME is something that we also need to recognise in this debate as a part of adding to the condition, not just being part of the condition itself. Happy giving way. Member for giving way. Um, like him, I've heard from very many of my constituents affected by ME and who have asked me to come today and make their voice heard. And really, I just wanted to congratulate them too. He was making the point about invisibility earlier, but actually some of those people who are not able to get out are doing things from their beds, mm. like the event that one of my constituents organised, lighting up the Time Bridge Blue last year. So there are things that people are doing to make sure we get the message across. Absolutely. Uh, I thank my more friend for that, that point. And actually, I think that, that I'm a big believer in digital, as colleagues in this house know, I often talk about it. But actually, the ability of uh, digital communities to connect the ME community together to help them share experiences and realise they're not on their own, I think is especially important. And I pay tribute to all those people, like my, uh, all my friends' constituent, who are doing so much. Um, but I also want to talk about the effect, in particular, on young people of ME. Because this is the condition that affects people of all ages, but sometimes the most acute effects can be for those for whom their lives have effectively been taken away at such a young age. Dawn reached out to tell me about her son, who is 16 years old and suffers from ME. 
that was initially brushed off as a migraine and a growing pain and was told children sometimes get stomach aches. She says, my intelligent, sporty, active son has now spent over two years virtually housebound. This horrible illness has robbed my son of his teenage years. He only has one friend left, has huge gaps in education, won't be able to at the school leave his assembly, nor the prom. He had to give up football and badminton, his real loves, and all we can do, all we can do is wait until he gets better. I think the stories of young people with ME are especially powerful because we all recognise the potential in our young people given the right opportunities, the right support, what amazing things they can and will do. But for many of our young people with ME, that's taken out. And because, especially for young people, losing time when they're in their school years not only affects their education, it affects society development, the friendship networks that they build around them, and is especially acute. Uh, I'm very grateful yeah, to my honourable yeah. friend. He'll be interested too, I'm sure, to hear of um, the 17-year-old son of my constituent who first contracted the illness um, when he was a young child, but it took seven years for the family to receive a diagnosis. That's an incredibly large proportion of a young person's life in which they suffer appalling ill health and no proper medical intervention at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. I thank, thank my friend for that intervention. Um, uh, the final one I just want to mention briefly was uh, Maya, who got in touch uh, talking about her sister, who is affected by ME. And she says, chronic illnesses need far more support and recognition than they, than they get. Her sister and herself with fibromyalgia have faced repeated uphill battles to get the help she needs, and that's even with, been with health professionals. It's been so, talked about so little that even doctors and nurses have been stumped as to how to help her. The disease cripples and takes lives, and we need to be doing more. I think there is something that we can take from this debate today that my uh, the member for Cheltenham mentioned about brain tumour research in the fact that the power of talking about a condition can achieve change. We saw that with Dame Chester Jowl, we're seeing it today around the world, actually, as today is Global MND Awareness Day, people talking about that condition. And we're seeing it in the work that our honourable friend from, uh, from Chesterfield is doing with fibromyalgia, talking about things that are not often talked about. That's why these debates are so important, to raise awareness of it, because the people with ME are not invisible. They're as human as you and I, and they need to be seen and heard. And that means investing in the proper medical research, the medical education for the medical practitioners, and ensuring that there is a relentless fight against stigma for all people with ME. Before he concludes... Have you given me a wait. <laughs> he began by talking about a stigma, the stigma of laziness or something in the head. Well, we all know that the sort of people who are afflicted by ME are certainly not those who are lazy. But with respect to something in the head, there may be some causes of ME that are psychological, but they are nonetheless an illness... And to treat it like that as something in the head, as if it wasn't an illness, is to reinforce the stigma that has been so damaging to mental health. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, and I think that was the most words I've ever heard the Honourable Member said since I've been elected. So, <laughs> I, I, I'm being famous for having short questions. Um, I, I agree entirely. And I think the challenge that we have in addressing stigma is understanding it. Because stigma builds where there's not that clear evidence base and understanding of what is happening to an individual. And we don't know whether it's one thing or many things here. That's why medical research is absolutely essential. And that's why understanding how this condition changes on a day-to-day -day basis and how government prepares and supports those individuals is so important. The DWP assessments is a great example of how the assessment system at the moment is built around a system that doesn't adequately recognise the day-to-day -day lived experiences of those with ME. And so concluding, uh, Mr Gapes, I just say that the relentless fight that we all need to do against the stigma to encourage more research can be done if we keep talking about this and keep remembering that people with ME are not invisible, they have a voice and they must be heard. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Stephen Pound. Thank you very much indeed, sir. And it's a pleasure to sit beneath your benevolent oversight, uh, Mr Gapes. And it's also, I'm very, very pleased that uh, my honourable friend, um, the member from Washington, and Sunderland West is on our front bench and also the Honourable Gentleman from Winchester because we have here two people who combine deep humanity with a, a real understanding of the way in which illness is examined, in way in which stereotypes can be challenged and in which stigma can be equally strongly challenged. But above all, Mr. Gates, I'd like to pay tribute and as I think everyone who has taken part in this debate would wish to do so, pay tribute to the Honourable Lady, the member for North West Glasgow. I was one of those people who was privileged to support her in the application to the Backbench Business Committee. And I think it's interesting that on that particular occasion, sitting at that table with the Honourable Lady, were members
members from the Scottish National Party, members from Plaid Cymru, from Labour, um, from the Conservative Party, and although there were no Liberals present at the time, um, the Honourable Gentleman for Surbiton and Kingston was present earlier on in that. And I think one of the reasons why we supported so strongly this debate and this application to the Backbench Business Committee was not just because there is a crying need at last for some proper authoritative research, but because of the personality and the argument and the case that the Honourable Lady for North West Glasgow had made. She is not just a sort of great humanitarian, but she is a scientist. She was a physics teacher, she's a pilot, she's a person who understands the importance of empirical evidence and data. She's a person who actually wants to see scientific evidence. And as somebody said on that occasion when we made the application, um, encephalomyelitis is probably the illness with the worst ever public relations officer ever in the history of illness because there is no other illness which is so badly presented about which there is so much nonsense spoken about which there are so many stigmas and stereotypes and one of the reasons I supported the Honourable Lady for North West Glasgow is because she's seeking to cut through all that nonsense to actually get back to some proper hard scientific evidence and move away from some of these dismissive cruel and fancy painful frankly painful comments that are made about people now we know that there are a number of arguments in favor of a proper analysis and subsequent to that treatment research and proper therapeutic assistance and aid for this ghastly debilitating illness. There's the economic case and the Optimum Health Clinic Foundation in, on, in September 2017 produced a very, very detailed breakdown in which they calculated that this illness cost the UK economy, the UK economy, over three billion pounds a year. You can make that argument, but I would go beyond grad grind, beyond that sort of desiccated calculating machine sort of politics, to the humanity. And Mr. Gates, just talk about one particular group of people, children and young people. Um, as many, many people, I'm sure it's been referred to already, uh, Dowsett and Colby, um, 21 years ago, produced some very, very detailed research in which they showed, and I say 21 years ago was when Dowsett and Colby produced this research, the biggest source, the biggest um, cause of long-term school absence, absence was, as we guess, encephalomyelitis. Now, imagine, Mr. Gapes, the situation. A child is at primary school. That child has the symptoms of encephalomyelitis but doesn't know the name, probably couldn't pronounce the name, doesn't even know what it is. But that child cannot bring themselves to school. This is not the schoolboy with his shining morning face creeping like a snail unwillingly to school. This is a child who simply cannot get out of bed, who cannot get off the sofa, who cannot get off the couch, who cannot get to school. And what happens to that child? I tell you, very often they're referred to social services. Very, very often child protection referrals are made because a child is missing school. And imagine the impact on that child, on that family, on that school. And above all, Mr. Gapes, and I've known you long enough to know that you're, you're a man that the milk of human kindness flows through your veins. Can you imagine what it would be like for a primary school child to know that they are suffering something terrible but cannot put it into words and they are being penalised for this? They're being interrogated. They've been asked to prove that they're ill when they can hardly bring themselves to even speak, to actually raise the energy to make the case. How cruel. And then... The parents, in some cases, the parents simply won't know. You can have a case, which is one of the reasons why I'm so particularly keen to have some proper empirical data and some proper research. You can have cases where there's four, five or six children in a family. One suffers and the others don't. Now, in a case like that, imagine how that one child must feel. Imagine how the other children will react to that child. Can you imagine anything more brutally cruel than that situation in which that child is trying to pursue his or her education but is physically incapable of doing so. And if you get it wrong, this is the, the great lesson we learned from Shawstart and earlier on from the Jesuits. In fact, you know, if you get it wrong in the first seven years, you've usually got it wrong for life. If a child is suffering in that way in primary school in the first few years, well, I despair for that child's future. So what we must do we must do is to actually cut through all this mist and fog and obfuscation, all this stigma, all these words, all these insulting expressions, and actually do some research. Is it psychological? Is it physical? Is it psychosomatic? What is it? What we do know is that it cannot go unaddressed any longer. 
We cannot allow another generation to grow up incapable, incapable of even giving a name to that which they suffer from. And if they cannot diagnose, then what is the prognosis? What is the therapeutic response? What is the health service doing? What is primary care? You know, what, what is the GP service doing? If they don't have the data, they cannot actually produce the cure. I don't make the case, Mr. Gapes, for the economic argument, important though it is. It is important, obviously. We do need productivity, we do need economic activity. But above all, the sheer humanity of the case that the Honourable Lady for North West Glasgow has made in her brilliant speech earlier on is something that I think would sweep absolutely everybody along who heard it today. This is a case where we simply cannot allow a situation to endure any longer. It is too painful, it is too cruel, it is too counterproductive and it is too dangerous. We are losing, we are losing young people. I know that sometimes that there's mature onset ME, I know about that. I know it's not just children. But they have had good advocates. They've had great speeches made on their behalf already this afternoon. I want to particularly make the case for the children because the children can very seldom make that case for themselves. I look to the minister and I look to my honourable friend on the front bench to say that today is the day here in June 2018 is where finally we started to take encephalomyelitis seriously and we stopped condemning people who suffer from this ghastly debilitating disease. Today is the day we said, yes, we understand the pain that people suffer. Yes, we're going to do something about it. Yes, we respect you. Yes, we value you. And yes, today we're going to start investing in diagnosis, analysis and, God willing, cure. Thank you. Gavin Newlands. Chair, uh, Mr Gipps, it's a, a pleasure to see you the chair and uh, like others I'd like to start with paying tribute to my old friend, uh, the member for Glasgow North West for um, securing today's debate and for setting the issues out um, so powerfully um, and in particular uh, for sharing the sad case of Merrin Collins which the honourable member for uh, Croft, sorry, um, Merrin Croft which the honourable member for Haywood Middleton um, elaborated on as her, her constituency um, in addition uh, I'd like to say to Professor Sharp um, that it's not my honourable friend's conduct that it's unbecoming, and rather it is yours. Um, and sending emails like this do nothing whatever for the reputation of the scientific research community, and you should apologise. Those with um, ME and related conditions don't believe their voices and concerns are properly listened to, and so it's, it's with that in mind uh, I'd like to pay tribute to our member for Stirling, um, who shared in great detail, yeah. with great compassion, uh, the story of Jill Smith, which affected uh, members across the House uh, deeply. Sometimes in this House, when we talk about health issues, we often talk about the condition in, a, in an abstract, abstract way without um, fully conveying the impact it has on people's lives. Uh, well, not today, Mr Gapes. Uh, Action for ME um, and the ME Association, both well represented in the, in the gallery today, along with many other organisations, perform vitally important work to champion and support the quarter of a million people across the UK who suffer from this condition. On Action for ME's website, they try to increase people's understanding of ME by asking them to imagine a number of situations. They state, imagine having months off work, um, off from work because you're so ill, so polaxed by fatigue and pain that you're no longer able to tell the time when you look at the face of a clock. Imagine you can no longer read even the shortest paragraph because your power of concentration is reduced to zero. One of my constituents who I've subsequently uh, met um, on two occasions wrote to me about the experience of li living with me. She said, one of the things that society needs to get to grips with is the fluctuating, fluctuating nature of ME where an individual may appear to be fine one day, yet the next day they are bedridden or much worse, or they may appear fine but really aren't. Unless people have x-ray vision, they cannot see the brain, spine, muscles, heart, cells and so on of another individual. The condition fluctuates not only from day to day and week to week, but it can vary from hour to hour. And of course there's the aspect, aspect of post-exertional exacerbation of symptoms. <coughs> after, that, after exertion, their ME symptoms often flare up, although this can be delayed. For one person, that exertion may be as little as getting up to brush your teeth. teeth. For another, it may be that they worked four hours that day instead of the three that would have been manageable. Mm -hmm. This could leave them ill the next day or being off work for a week. 
There can also be a sudden and severe decline in symptom, symptoms. For example, an individual may have gone out that day feeling okay, but whilst out, they suddenly reach saturation point and the levels of physical fatigue and pain may be intolerable. Mr Gibbs, this is the experience that a quarter of a million people in the UK are going through. And uh, as a society, it's very important that we do more, in fact, much more, uh, to find a cure for this disease. Sadly, the majority of people with ME don't have access to adequate care and support. Shamefully, they also face ignorance and injustice from people who should really know better, including medical professionals and uh, the government. Many primary care professionals receive minimal training on ME and it continues to be dismissed as medically unexplained. The treatment for ME currently focuses on addressing the different symptoms of the condition, but as we've heard, uh, concerns have been raised many, many times about the recommended treatments such as CBT and GET. Like other members, I'm glad that NICE um, are reviewing their guidelines and hope that ME sufferers are at the heart of the review's outcomes. Mr Gapes, this government's, welfare, uh, this government's welfare reforms are causing a lot of heartache and stress for millions of people, including people with ME, many of whom struggle to access uh, welfare benefits. The written evidence um, submitted by Action for ME to the UK Parliament's Work and Pensions Committee during their inquiry into PIP and e-assessments, which was uh, touched on by the Honourable Member for Gloucester, raised very serious concerns about how the current welfare state treats people with ME. Their research found that assessors don't have a sufficient or even basic understanding of the condition to be able to carry out accurate assessments for people affected by it. This causes assessors to misinterpret their conditions, wrongly diagnosing them and filing inaccurate reports which have dire consequences on people's, people's benefit entitlement. This basic lack of understanding of ME is forcing individuals down the mandatory reconsideration and appeal route to gain access to benefits they are rightly entitled to. 76% of people with ME, ME who are forced to do this believe that their initial assessment failed to properly represent their condition or needs. 52% believed that the assessment wasn't conducted fairly or appropriately. 32% said the amount that they were awarded didn't cover or meet their need. This is, experience is also familiar to, uh, one, to one of my con constituents I assisted uh, recently. She is ME along with um, other medical conditions and told me she feels that ESA and PIP assessments are designed in a way that discriminates against people with ME and other fluctuating and unseen conditions. This causes untold distress and harm to people with ME who already feel very vulnerable and unheard. She also believes that the assessments have led to her condition deteriorating and without a shadow of a doubt she would have been able to go back to work a very long time ago if it was not for the recurring relapses caused by a system that is supposed to support you while ill and while trying to recover and instead it causes harm. It is exhausting, demeaning and damaging to recovery. She feels that people with ME often feel ridiculed abandoned and even bullied and abused. It's a highly vulnerable place to be when your basic needs and in some cases your continued existence and the way you are treated and viewed by society is dependent upon the understanding of those with power. I'm sure she isn't the only one who feels this way. Now, Mr Gibbs, I accept that ME can be an invisible condition, but surely the government can take this into account so that people receive fair assessments um, as my constituent also said, the more people who begin to learn the truth about this devastating condition, the sooner people with ME can begin to be treated with the respect and dignity that people with serious medical conditions are entitled to. As a society, we need to challenge ourselves to better understand this condition, and this should start with government. Now, the Scottish Government has funded a project to educate health and social care professionals and improve the health and social care support available for people with ME. The Inform Me project will develop a peer mentoring self-management support network to build confidence and reduce isolation in people affected by ME. There is an acceptance, also we've heard today many times, that not enough research has been done to increase the knowledge of different forms of ME. However, since the creation of the UK CFS slash ME Research Collaborative in 2013, it's hoped that greater attention can be brought to this area. But it's certainly true that ME has received far less funding for research on other conditions with similar prevalence and disease burden. And this funding has tended to be for psychological and behavioural studies rather than biomedical research. Now, as my friend out outlined earlier, the Scottish Government is also taking steps um, within this area and has recently announced 
a PhD scholarship focused on improving understanding of FME. In conclusion, Mr Gapes, all of us, um, of all political persuasions and none, would like to see a world uh, without ME. Uh, the Minister has listened to many strong views this afternoon. I know he will be eagerly awaiting the outcome of the nice review, uh, but I hope he will take on board many of the points that have been made um, and go and reflect on, particularly the areas, the questions he's been asked around GET um, and DWP uh, procedures with regards to um, ME um, and to help those with the condition, uh, living with this condition um, sooner rather than later. Sharon Hodgson. Um, Mr Gates, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship today. Um, I would like to thank, I would like to start by thanking the Honourable Member for um, Glasgow North West for her excellent speech um, in setting the scene today and for securing this debate and um, also for the Backbench Business Committee for granting the time for this very important debate today. I would also like to thank um, all the Honourable Members. Um, there was a, a, a great number today, the Members for Kingston and Surbiton, Mid-Dorset and North Pool, Stroud, Cheltenham, Strangford, um, Bristol East, Stirling, Luton North, Haywood and Middleton, Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport, Ealing North and Paisley and Renfrewshire North for their excellent and moving speeches. And also for the many other members who made excellent interventions. Um, I really think the packed gallery today and the number of members attending and speaking in this debate on a Thursday afternoon really shows the strength of feeling not only in Parliament but in the nation as a whole yeah, yeah. for more to be done to help people with MA get the help, recognition and support and treatment that they deserve and need. I also want to thank ME Action, Action for ME, ME Association and ME Trust for the very detailed um, briefs that they sent to me and for ME North East and especially the um, Sunderland and South Tyneside ME Support Group and Professor Malcolm Hooper who I first met with way back in um, 2010 about this very issue um, for all the work that they do to campaign for better care, support and recognition for people living with ME. Now, as we've heard um, today in great and moving detail, with numerous members sharing um, tragic and very personal stories from their constituents, for whom we have to um, thank them for allowing their stories to be told today, ME is a neurological disease or a disease of the central nervous system. But that does not begin to explain how devastating it can be to have to live with this condition or die from it, as we've heard so tragically happened to 21-year-old Merrin Crofts. And I thank the Honourable Member for Hayward and Middleton, who was her constituency MP, and the Honourable Member for Glasgow North West, and also her family, for allowing her story to be shared with us in some detail today to help make the case so strongly in this debate. ME affects an estimated 250,000 adults and children in the UK and around 17 million people worldwide. And despite so many people being affected by ME, ME, it is little understood in the medical world, leaving patients feeling dismissed, neglected and stigmatised further by their condition. This comes as no surprise as there has been no significant research into the condition as we have heard today. MA currently receives far less research funding than other neurological conditions of similar prevalence or disease burden. A written question from the Honourable Member for Glasgow North West revealed that the average research spent per person living with MA is around just £1 per a year, as she cited earlier. And the majority of this tiny amount of research spending does not even come from the government, but rather from the charity sector. Does the Minister think that research into this condition should be left entirely up to the charity sector? The MA charity sector in the UK do a fantastic job in researching this condition. For example, the MA Biobank is a vital part of the MA research infrastructure and has achieved an international reputation. And all the start-up costs for the ME Biobank were funded by the charity sector and ongoing costs are being met by the ME Association Ramsey Research Fund. 
Does the government have any plans to contribute to this research? Patients with ME feel that they have been let down time and again as research such as the PACE trial, which we've heard of um, extensively today, have been found to be seriously flawed. In fact, Emeritus Professor of Medicine Jonathan Edwards said that the PACE trial would be a great example in an undergraduate textbook as an object lesson in how not to design a trial. In addition, a petition signed by more than 12,000 individuals, mostly patients, over 90 scientists and clinicians, and more than 50 patient groups worldwide have demanded a retraction of the results of that trial. So does the Minister agree with me that ME patients deserve a trial that they can trust won't dim dismiss their condition or recommend treatments that could actually make their condition worse? Does the government have any plans to fund a proactive and coordinated piece of research for ME that patients can trust? Because of the lack of medical research into ME, it is not surprising that healthcare professionals are not sufficiently trained in diagnosing the condition, as we've heard today from honourable members. According to several ME charities, coverage of ME in many medical textbooks remains inadequate and can be misleading or even non-existent. The Chief Medical Officer's report and the NICE guideline on ME set out clear timeline markers for making an early and accurate diagnosis. Both recommended that adults should have normally had the diagnosis confirmed within four months from onset of symptoms and within three months for children and young people. However, standard medical tests often find nothing wrong which initially leads many doctors to dismiss ME as psychological. A patient survey by ME, the ME Association in 2016 indicates that only a small number of patients are receiving a positive diagnosis within six months of onset. Further experiences from the charity sector suggest that a majority of patients have to wait for over a year and a significant number for many years before they receive a diagnosis. This means that patients are being dismissed and stigmatised further yeah, yeah, yeah. and, more importantly, aren't then receiving the care and the support that they need. Does the Minister have any plans to create a care pathway for people with ME to ensure that patients are giving access to the care and treatment they require in a timely manner? Additionally, has the Minister made any assessment of the effects ME and the delay in diagnosis has on women in particular? Because... I find it incredibly illuminating that 75% of patients with ME are women. And this leads me to believe that there is an issue here of women's pain being dismissed and not taken seriously by healthcare professionals. Will the Minister perhaps consider this issue in his response? It is therefore clear that more training is required, not only for healthcare professionals, but also for welfare assessors. A survey by Action for ME found that 79% of survey respondents disagreed with the statement that their assessor had sufficient expertise of their condition to effectively and appropriately conduct the assessment. Because symptoms of ME can fluctuate so much and are often invisible, as we've heard, the condition is very difficult to manage for patients and also difficult, it has to be said, for welfare assessors to detect. A patient may perform well during a welfare assessment, but what an assessor will not see is how long the patient rested in order to perform those tasks during the assessment or how long it takes them to recover afterwards. As we know, the onerous and ill-conceived assessment process can not only result in an inaccurate award, but can also lead to an exacerbation of ME symptoms, which can result in a long-term deterioration of the individual's health. Has the Minister had any conversations with his ministerial colleagues in the Department for Work and Pensions on this matter? So it is clear to say from this excellent debate this afternoon and the majority of the issues arising from ME are because it is so little understood. The government should really consider funding research into ME to better our understanding of this condition, which will then hopefully, in time, improve perceptions of ME and also improve the routes to diagnosis, care and treatment. Thank you.
Minister Steve Bryan. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr Gapes. Let me start where others have all started and um, thank very much the, the lady from Glasgow North West for, for tabling this important debate, along with, I believe, the lady for Loughborough, who, is, um, who has to be in her constituency today to deal with a royal visit. Lucky her. So, uh, ra raising the awareness of, the, of this debilitating condition is critical, and I know she's undertaken significant work in this area over a number of years that uh, she's been working on this. Um, we've had 13, lucky for us, 13 backbenchers speak in today's debate. I counted that there were at one point 25 members present at, the, uh, at our peak. Uh, which is excellent. For I, I spend a lot of time uh, with the member for Strangford, it must be said, in uh, <laughs> in, in West uh, <laughs> in Westminster Hall, and that is a, that's a lot for a Tuesday afternoon, let alone a Thursday afternoon. Um, so, so that is excellent. Now, now, as we've heard today, Mr. Gapes, Emmy, otherwise known as chronic fatigue syndrome, is incapacitating condition with a plethora of symptoms. So primarily characterised, of course, by long-term fatigue, chronic pain, and post-exertional symptoms or malaise, to name but a few. And there are many, many more. And we've heard some excellent um, testimony today, haven't we, from, from members uh, who, on behalf of their constituents. So it is true to say, that, as, as so many have said, that the underlying causes of the condition, which for brevity I'm going to just call ME during this debate, uh, are still poorly understood. Um, the truth is there is no one diagnostic test to identify it, and although some people can improve and recover, and some do, there is currently no cure, and that is a, a hard reality to face, but it is a reality. So, so while I understand, of course, that the severity of symptoms and therefore the impact varies, we know that ME can lead to poor attendance and outcomes at school for young people affected. I have a, a constituent myself in exactly this position who I am in regular correspondence with. She knows who she is, um, and I won't name her, but I wish her and her mum well. Um, obviously results in significant or indefinite time off work or job loss in adults. Uh, reduction or cessation completely in daily activities, which can lead to obviously isolation and the strain within families and breakdown of marriages, it has to be said, and overall poor quality of life. Um, and as my friend from Sterling said, almost no life for some, for some people and, uh, and their loved ones. And this, this is probably a good point to say. I, I, I have to say I'm surprised that other than the, the lady from Bristol East, nobody mentioned unrest in, in this debate. I, I, I know it well, and um, some constituents came to see me to tell me about the film, and it had some screenings in Winchester in my constituency and Charles Ford in my constituency, which were oversubscribed, um, packed to the gunnels, and uh, not a dry eye in the house. And uh, I, I just want to pay great tribute, I think, to, to Jennifer and Omar, actually. I mentioned partners, didn't I? Jennifer and her partner, Omar, who, who made that film. And I'm sure there were times when it gave Jennifer a great purpose to her life, but I'm sure there were times when she um, wanted to say, um, just get that beep, beep camera out of my life. Um, it was a really interesting uh, and touching moment at the very start of the film when she, she said when she was a young girl... She wanted to eat the whole world whole because she wanted to see it all and do it all. And that was sort of went to the heart of her great disappointment um, that she was so sick. And as many have spoken about today, I think Jen, Jennifer set out very um, clearly and movingly the sheer ups and downs of this condition. And for some, it is almost a constant down. Um, I was struck by watching her at the, the Princeton uh, university on um, reunion day with a rather surreal um, <laughs> procession through the streets of uh, old boys and girls from Princeton but she was so enjoying that day and seeing old friends and uh, really looked uh, full of life um, but then literally within uh, an hour of it finishing she was absolutely polaxed on the floor saying that she felt her eyes were pushing outside pushing pushing from inside out of her head um, and it was horrible to watch um, it was also interesting the way that the film moved around the different wild and crazy treatments that there are out there on the internet. In Google any condition, you'll see lots of wild and crazy treatments, but certainly you do on, on ME, and it was interesting to see that. One of the saddest things I, I thought in it was the, 
And the, the point the member for Cheltenham raised was about the, the suicides that we see around this condition. And, uh, and that, that was covered well. And the, and the millions missing part, which has been mentioned by a lot today, I see some people wearing T-shirts here in Westminster today, I think is an absolutely excellent... I know, I know the member for Freedom North is right in saying that it you know, does have some bad PR, but I think it's getting its act together, because I think millions missing is an absolutely brilliant uh, way of encapsulating the, the problem here. And, um, yeah, in a second. And the, a number of people have mentioned the shoes. And uh, I... I, I I was particularly moved by the, um, the messages on the shoes. And there was, they were outside New Old Richmond House, where Department of Health was until last year, as part of the Millions Missing campaign. And somebody had written on one of the pairs of shoes, uh, the, the, the mission was to write what you miss. And uh, somebody had written on, their, on a pair of ballet shoes, I miss dancing in these shoes, which was a, such a, what a human way of, uh, of putting it. And I thought um, that, that, was abs- that, was, that was really moving to, say, to see that. And um, I maybe touched on the film at the end again. I was not implying any absence of PR skills on behalf of the advocates and the people who suffer from this debilitating disease. I was referring, I was anthropomorphising the actual disease yeah. itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the point that the Honourable Gentleman, the member for Cheltenham, made when we actually made our pitch to the Backbench Business Committee, as he wasn't in Westminster Hall at the time, I stole his, pl- his words. Yes. <laughs> no, no, good. Good, good clarifier. <laughs> <laughs> so unlike, so unlike the honourable gentleman. So uh, let me just touch on stigma, which has been touched on by pretty much everyone who's spoken today, quite rightly. Um, we, we obviously recognise that people with ME have encountered significant stigma, in part due to here we go the unfavourable media representations of this condition going back to the 1980s. But not not just the 1980s. In very um, recent times, I, I've seen a clip where Ricky Gervais in one of his otherwise amusing stage shows uh, refers to Emmy and says yes that's the one where they say I don't want to go to work today mm-hmm. and, and I have to say that you know Ricky Gervais is a very talented um, comic but I think uh, given that he's quite active on Twitter um, maybe he could just um, retract that and apologise to the Emmy community uh, for that comment um, today on Twitter and uh, he can hashtag um, Emmy so we'll look out for that um, the other point on stigma was made so well by my uh, right honourable friend from New Forest West about mental health. You know, yes, it is totally wrong and, um, and insulting to say this is all in the head, um, but, it, but it also goes against the grain of what we're talking about in modern day healthcare is that there's a parity between mental and physical health. There must be a parity between mental and physical health and suggest that um, to say that somehow lessens it is wrong. And I thought his intervention was very timely and very, very good. Um, the, the physical impacts of this condition have impacts on mental health. And as others have said today, I am also the cancer minister. I stand here in lots of debates in Westminster Hall and we talk about the mental impact of cancer. And uh, my shadow from, from Sunderland knows, knows all about those debates where we talk about the, the mental impact of blood cancer, for instance, which is one of the most recent ones I remember. So, you know, we know that people with ME are often report the legitimacy of their symptoms has been questioned by by family, by friends, by employers, yes, by healthcare professionals and by society as a whole. But I think, lest you didn't get that, um, Mr Gates, from my opening remarks, let me just be clear that the government ministers, especially this one, are not among that group of people. So this stigma can play and does play a part in the development of comorbid symptoms of depression and anxiety, particularly for young people, who I'll come on to in a minute, who feel the consequences keenly of resultant social isolation, particularly uh, at that moment of their development. And as we've heard, suicide is not unheard of. Now, we know that those who experience stigma often experience discrimination as well, which has got a profound negative impact on their lives. This is quite simply unacceptable. And so I welcome the debate as a forum for raising awareness of ME and talking about it. And the gentleman from Plymouth spoke about NMD uh, that's being talked about today. And he's absolutely right. And he's a very good communicator. And I think this will probably be on Facebook Live as one of his next Facebook Live sessions. I almost feel certain it will be. He's nodding from a sedentary position. So it's very important that we're raising awareness and we're educating people, including me, about this condition, the impact that it has on people's lives. So let me turn to the two issues that primarily we've debated today, research and treatment, beginning with research. So the government invests over £1.7 billion a year in health research via the National Institute for Health Research and the Medical Research Council through the UK Research Innovation. 
Together, the NIHR and the MRC welcome high-quality applications for research into all aspects of CFS and ME, which would certainly include the biomedical research that my honourable friend spoke about in her opening remarks. Since 2011, the MRC has funded seven projects on CFS ME, totaling £2.62 million, and the MRC is ready to support further applications of the highest scientific quality, as that is what required to make these scientific breakthroughs. Now, my rumble friend from Northwest Norfolk is no longer in his place, but he spoke, and didn't he, didn't he uh, push that a few times, um, about the Norfolk Research Park, which sounds very promising, and uh, I, I look forward to hearing more about that. I feel certain that he will tell me. Now, indeed, the, the, the MRC has a cross-board highlight notice on ME open since 2003, updated in 2011, alongside a bespoke funding call in that year. ME research remains an area of high strategic importance for the MRC. Applications are encouraged, which sort of focus on the underpinning mechanism of ME, with priority areas including immune dysregulation, sorry, distracted by stop something outside, stop ME, I think he's saying outside, um, pain, improved subphenotyping and specification of ME and mechanisms of ME in children and young people. Now, Tessa Jowell has been mentioned by a number of people today, the late Baroness Jowell, and um, I, I'm very privileged to meet her, um, just the once, but I was left in no doubt as to uh, resolve on the issue of brain tumours. And what I would say in reference to, to, to Baroness Jowell and the research environment, as my PPS reminded me during the debate, I think that journey started around a Westminster Hall debate, so maybe that's a good sign. But the challenge that we've had with brain tumour research is the lack of enough high-quality research proposals coming forward. And one of the things that the, the, the late Baroness was so passionate about and that we have so latched onto is to stimulating the research community to get that situation changed. And that is one of her great legacies. Her greatest legacy is yet to be uh, uh, reached, I would hazard a guess. But that is why one of the reasons why it is important to mention the late Baroness today. So the NIHR has, since 2011, provided £3.37 million of funding for projects and training on ME. This is not biomedical research in the way that you may term it, but as with other disorders, given the cause and mechanisms of this condition are still poorly understood, it is important that we carry out both biomedical research to further our understanding of, of this and applied health research to improve the treatment offered to people with ME now and help to improve their symptoms and their quality of life. So the NIHR and the MRC recognise that ME is a debilitating condition and they're working with the UK ME Research Collaborative, which was mentioned uh, towards the end of the debate, and patient representatives about how best they can support a joined-up approach to encourage the high-quality research into this complex disorder that I mentioned. Baroness Jowell is such a good example of how you start. <coughs> they hope to be able to update colleagues on these discussions by the end of the year, and I, for one, will be looking keenly for that. Now, for those members who may not know about this important collaboration, it was set up in 2013 to promote high-quality basic and applied research into ME. ME. The CMRC brings together researchers, major funders, charities, to provide a mechanism to work together in a coordinated and collaborative way, increase awareness of ME in the research community, so important if we're going to stimulate those applications, highlight priorities for research funding, and increase funding for research. Now, both the NIHR and the MRC sit as observers on their board. So many people speaking today, um, passionately by everybody actually, but, uh, but very passionately by the member for Ealing North, and I, I like his point about humanity. This is a matter of, of good Christian humanity in many ways. So the Royal College of General Practitioners oversees GP training in England. They, they provide an online course to GPs and other primary care practitioners, which includes an overview on the presentation, the diagnosis, the assessment, and the ongoing management of ME. It highlights common misconceptions about the condition and considers the challenges that surround what is a very complex condition for patients, for carers and for primary care professionals. This course is produced as part of the metric study funded by the NIHR. And of course GPs can always know more and learn more, but I think we just just, just to speak up for them for a moment, you know, they are called general practitioners. 
be a GP for a day, it is an incredibly difficult job to know everything about everything and to be a master of all. Um, so general practice is, though, where most patients with ME are likely to be managed, certainly in the first instance, and the condition is identified as a key area of clinical knowledge in the RCGP Applied Knowledge Test content guide. The AKT is a summative assessment of the knowledge base that underpins general practice in England and is a key part of GPs qualifying exams. So while I understand the points made in the debate today about raising awareness among medical professionals, and I continue to do this, and I will continue to do this, we will de redouble my efforts as a result of today's debate uh, as part of my role as the Minister for Primary Care. All GPs should they certainly should be aware of ME, and they should maintain their clinical knowledge of this and other conditions as part of their commitment to continuing professional development. Indeed, I have resolved and sent a note to myself already to send a copy of today's debate to Professor Helen Stokes-Lampard, who currently leads the RCGP, and to ask for her latest thinking from the College on this subject. Treatment, Mr Gates. Before treatment can begin for any medical condition, it must, of course, be diagnosed. And this goes to the heart of our challenge here. As the symptoms of ME often resemble those of, of many other debilitating illnesses, and we've heard about Lyme disease today, there is no test with which to make an accurate diagnosis. It's not, therefore, always easy to diagnose, putting it mildly. So diagnosis relies on clinical observation of symptoms, by our healthcare professionals. Now, we understand that this can be, to put it mildly, frustrating for patients, and I think they're clinicians, it must be said. People with ME should be referred to a specialist service where care should be based on their needs, the type, complexity, and severity of their symptoms, and the presence of any comorbidities. Now, this is a decision which should be made jointly by the patient affected and by their healthcare professionals. As, as my shadow said, referral to a specialist ME care should be offered within six months of presentation to people with milder symptoms, within three to four months of presentation to people with moderate symptoms, and immediately to people with severe symptoms. Now, clinicians are responsible for advising patients on the treatment options available. And of course, Mr Gates, I'm aware that access to services for those with severe ME is a big and ongoing issue. But the configuration of services is a local matter for local NHS commissioners under the 2013 Act passed by this place. They have to be best placed to deliver services for their area. But following the Chief Medical Officer's independent working group on ME, whose report was published in 2002, and we've heard a number of people refer to it today, a central investment programme of £8.5 million was established to address the service gaps across England. I am responsible for the NHS in England. Now, this included the establishment of 13 centres of expertise across the country, 36 multidisciplinary community teams for adults, and 11 specialist teams for children and young people, and facilitation of access to advice on clinical management to patients, to families, and to health professionals. Linked to that, it is now, of course, the Department of Health and Social Care. The vast majority of people with severe ME, Mr Gapes, and their families will come into contact with social care services at some point. So the Care Act requires that where an adult or carer appears to have care and support needs, the local authority must carry out a needs assessment. It must then decide if the person has eligible needs by considering the outcomes the person wants to achieve, what needs they have, and how these impact on their overall well-being. So where a person is assessed as having eligible care and support needs, these must be met by their local authority. Let me say some more about children and young people now, which has been mentioned by um, a number of people. There was a, a very powerful moment in the, in the unrest film of a young lady who was celebrating her birthday. And she said, I remember my 16th birthday in this bed, and my 17th birthday, and my 18th birthday, and it went through to her, I think it was her 22nd birthday that she was celebrating in the film. So, so while access to services is being raised today, I know that, that access to education is a huge issue for children and young people with ME. All schools have a legal duty, Mr Gapes, to make arrangements to support pupils with a medical condition in school. Guidance to schools says they should put arrangements in place which show an understanding of how medical conditions affect a pupil's ability to learn and give parents and young people confidence in the school's ability to provide effective support for their condition. Children and young people with ME should have an individual health care plan normally drawn up in partnership with the school, with health care professionals, parents and the young person 
tailored to their needs. So schools and other services should work together to ensure that children and young people with ME receive an education which is flexible, appropriate, that this could mean programs of study which rely on part-time attendance in combination with alternative provision or homeschooling, as has, been, as has been said, and consideration should also be given to how children and young people are integrated back into school after a period of absence when they're feeling better and hopefully more able to physically cope. Lots has been said about NICE guidelines, so let me come on and talk about that, which is clearly a sensitive topic and the source of much unhappiness uh, among members and the wider ME community. So Mr Gates, according to guidelines from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, recommended treatments for ME include cognitive behavioural therapy and this graded exercise therapy. Now I know that many patients disagree with these and we've heard powerful testimony today. The NICE guideline is clear that there is no one form of treatment to suit every patient. The personal needs and preferences of the patient should be taken into account. Doctors should explain that no single strategy will be successful for all patients. And in common with all people receiving NHS care, ME patients, of course, have the right to refuse or withdraw from any part of their treatment that they don't agree with or they think is doing them harm. So as we've heard, Mr Gapes, the NICE guideline is being updated jolly good job too, and it will look across the current evidence base, including at the PACE trial, which, which has been debated at length in this, in this House before. Let me just, just say, and I will, of course we welcome NICE's decision to undertake a full review of ME guidelines. You know, I know that many uh, of the ME charities that we've heard about today are registered to take part in that guideline development process. But NICE is the independent expert body responsible for developing robust evidence-based guidance for the NHS to design services that are in line with the best available evidence. And no one should hide from the evidence. So I think it would be inappropriate but, and wrong for ministers to interfere with this process. But I, I feel sure that uh, NICE will be listening to debate debate and taking a keen interest in it. Let me give way to the lady from Glasgow. Thank the Minister for giving way and he has said rightly that any patient has the right to withdraw from medical treatment. However, when the DWP are saying patients must undertake graded exercise therapy, when health insurance companies are saying they must undertake graded exercise therapy, it puts the patient in a very difficult position. No, I, I, fully, I fully appreciate that, 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 that point that she, made, she put it on the record very, very well earlier. And that takes us on very neatly to, to, the, to the welfare benefits point. So the members who requested the debate also flagged the issue of, of benefits. And, uh, and I understand, and I know they would, would, would like and are having an ongoing conversation with DWP. So, so DWP, you know, clearly I am not a DWP minister. Um, and the, the debate wanted a health minister to respond to it. That's what they have. So, so DWP recognises that ME obviously is a real and disabling condition. Entitlement to benefits depends on the disabling effects of the condition, which of course and rightly must be taken on an individual basis. So when assessing claimants, healthcare professionals are expected, we expect them to be mindful of the fact that many illnesses, including ME, produce symptoms that vary in intensity over time and are instructed not to base their opinions solely on the situation observed at the assessment. Now DWP assure me that all healthcare professionals are required to read an evidence-based protocol on ME as part of their training, as well as engaging in a programme of continuing medical education, which includes modules on this condition. Now, members clearly, from what I've heard today, feel that that is not happening, and certainly not happening in a consistent way. So I will take uh, an action from this to send a copy of what's being said to the relevant minister, the lady, the member for Truro, if I believe is right, at the department for DWP. But I would encourage members in the all-party group to seek more and continuing engagement with the DWP on this issue, and I will certainly follow that up with them. Now, once again, Mr. Gapes, let me, me thank the, the member for Glasgow Northwest in opening the debate and the colleagues who brought this debate through the Backbench Business Committee to, to happen today for raising the issues of research and for treatment into ME on behalf of those affected, on behalf of their constituents and mine. You know, I welcome, I welcome this and all the other opportunities to raise awareness uh, within the House. Because that ultimately is what we can do, is to raise awareness. And that can lead to action and lead to real change, as we saw it did with, and it is within the brain tumour community. I'd like to thank the ME charities, and there are, they're very active in my part of the world in Hampshire for their continuing work in this area. 
it's been fascinating today and as always in debates in, in my portfolio. I haven't heard one single person mention their party political colours and uh, there really is no politics in ME and nor should there be. So I, I want to see us come together at our true cross-party best yeah. to focus on the needs of people with ME and to see if we can move the research agenda forward in this area because I think the lady from Glasgow said in her opening remarks that the, the professionals should welcome research because that ultimately is what is the basis of their training, which is evidence-based treatment. And, uh, and I welcomed their research. And I would echo what has been said, that the email that she read out earlier, which I clearly haven't seen, I've only heard her reporting of it, um, I think she's going to give it to me afterwards. I, um, I, I hope that that's the second apology that, that is received as a result of my remarks today, and I'll look forward to being copied into that. So as I said earlier, the NIHR and the MRC are speaking with the UK CF. SME Research Collaborative and the patient representatives about how they can best support a joined up approach to high quality research into this complex, complex disorder. I hope they will update colleagues about these discussions later in the year. And I just want to end with something that, um, that Jennifer said in the, in the unrest film, right at the very end of the film. She said, um, everything I've ever read um, about being poorly is that you, you get sick and then you either get better or you you die. Um, put, put another way, when you get sick, it always ends in triumph or tragedy. Uh, that's not my story. Not yet. That's how she put it. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Carol Monaghan to wind up. And can I just thank the honourable members this afternoon once again. Thursday afternoon is not an easy time to stay behind for a debate, so I really do appreciate it and also appreciate such great support from the public gallery. Yeah. Um, many of the, the people in the public gallery, of course, are living with ME themselves. It's been tough enough for us sitting here for three years, can I say. It really must have been a hard slog for you guys sitting for three years, and I hope the impact of this debate over the next few days is not felt too badly as a result. Um, I've also been following this debate on Twitter and what's been interesting is the messages of support that have been coming in for individual members throughout the debate. People really are watching and we're really interested and encouraged by what they heard. And this is, this is although we're talking about treatment and diagnosis in the UK, this actually has far wider repercussions because the messages of support have been coming in from Norway, from Canada, from the States, from right across Europe. So this is something that affects people worldwide and um, I hope this debate has given them some hope. Um, but this debate was about more than just raising awareness and there were specific questions that members asked. Um, I'm glad that the Minister has mentioned the DWP guidelines and he's going to, uh, he's going to work with them um, with uh, to draw up guidelines for people with ME. I think that's something we'll, we'll all work, watch with interest and maybe there'll be some parliamentary questions going in as a result of that. Um, but I was also a bit disappointed. I know the Minister is a, a very compassionate person um, and he talked about the funding of ME research and he talked about the figures as well. I think he mentioned 2.6 million that the Medical Research Council are currently putting forward into ME research. Unfortunately, though, this is not biomedical research, or very little of it is. I mean, I just quickly had a Google. There's a, a new research uh, programme is taking place at Bath University. Once again, looking, at, it's a department of psychology. And this is where we have the trouble. It's not the department of psychology that needs to be doing the, the research, it's a department of medicine mm. or biomedical sciences. So finally, to the ME community, uh, the members here have spoken passionately on your behalf. I don't see this as being the end. So I, I really once again thank everybody here this afternoon and the fight for the people with ME, both here and across the world, continues. Yeah. Question is that this House has considered myalgic encephalomyelitis treatment and research. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Of the contrary, no. I think
think the eyes have it. Order, order, 